And we're alive. Good timing. I'll tell you about that later. And we're alive. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Holy Crap, the Vlogcast. The Vlogcast comes from a skeptical point of view to answer some of the questions of why. The Vlogcast comes as a combination of spite and the Streisand effect, because uh, people on Facebook really, really still don't know how to argue. People who are like 20 years older than me, easy. Oh, dude, when I say put up or shut up, really? You, you you didn't understand that part? I mean, dumbing it down from if you put the positive claim, you have to provide the evidence. And I say it translates to in a schoolyard parlance, shut up or put up. And you, and you still don't get whatever the fuck. Yeah, the guy from last week. Long, long story on this one. Part of this is to follow through with the old adage, sometimes the journey is more important than the destination. And the journey in this case was I almost forgot to have my hat on just in time. I'm your main host. I'm known as Shujin Tribble pretty much all over the place. You can find me under most social media that way, S-H-U-J-I-N. Let me go ahead and introduce you to everybody because uh, we've, we've, got, we've got something going on. Top left-hand corner of the continent. Good evening, Dallin. Good evening. From just north of me, and still it's cold up over there. Good morning, heretic woman. Good morning. What did I miss last week? Sounds like you had too much fun without me. Uh, st stuff. <laughs> I had I had stuff. Oh, last week was hilariously funny. You missed all the things. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about part of that another time. From the Midwest of the U.S., good evening, Bridget. Good evening. From just outside of, he doesn't get any snow because of all the hot air that's wafting out from Washington, D.C. Good morning, Henry No Tech. Hi. No, we didn't get snow. We got, well, a little bit, but we mostly got sleep and freezing rain. See, perfect. Mm -hmm. And from over the water into Paris, friends. Good morning, Joseph. Bonjour. He's he's actually doing a lot better. Uh, I I got him early for the. Uh, wait, he was the first one that signed on for the show this uh, for the host link. So that was wait it, the way he sounds. Is that why they call them frogs? It could be. We'll, we'll discuss <laughs> this. It's la grenouille. <laughs> I was just yeah, curious. I, I mean, I'm... my throat. <laughs> it's it's our it's 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 early in the morning for him. So that's you're that's only it supposed is. to eat the legs, dude. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was gonna say you don't swallow the thing whole, do you? What he does on his weekends is his business and his business. <laughs> right. I have a However, thing. we don't judge. You say that now. However, for those I'll of you that are track. watching, for those of you that are watching, of course, you'll notice that we have uh, we have one missing and one new. Yes, we're kind of still waiting on Joey. It's possible he may be uh, sleeping. It's cold, so it wouldn't entirely surprise me. So it is his time of year for hibernation, after all. Yeah. True enough. We'll see how that plays out. But otherwise, we have a new personality joining us. Yes, we have a scientist again. Oh, my Lord. Yes, the great Thor has granted us a, a research scientist. So, mystery guest, would you sign in, please? Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Courtney Plant. I go by uh, Nuka in the furry fandom. And I am a, I guess I'm the token psychologist here. <laughs> Token is right, and the, the only reason I can get away with saying that is because those those one dollar, two dollar coins. Dallin and I talked about Canadian everything, and it's it's come on, it, it's it they're they're fun tokens to me, and I can say that because I've got a bag of of pennies still Canadian pennies. I know what I'm gonna do with them now. I'm gonna I'm gonna use them in the I'm gonna use them in the in the in the in rolling the, the machines. Thing. Yeah, in the rolling the machine, machine so that I can, yeah. yeah, so I can do them over at the Niagara Falls. It's still going to cost like, me a uh, buck fifty. Like, but... like, like this little guy right here. If only, there it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Except it's not focus. It's focusing on your eyes. Imagine yeah. that. Mm -hmm. I think I've got those. I think I've got one of those from about uh, three different truck stops along uh, the turnpike between Pennsylvania and Michigan. Oh, okay. Oh. See, you, we, we were talking about stuff last night. It's like, yeah, there's no such thing as a turnpike. It's like, <clears> wait, <throat> wait, you just said that you were, oh, America, right. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I got it. Yeah, I'm like, turnpike, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things we were talking about. And, yeah. uh, a pike uh, is a fish. Yeah, I, I was so going to say, a, a turnpike is, is one that, you know, tries to spin around when you're trying to catch it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, yep. no, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, the northern pike or the jackfish uh puts up one hell of a fight they they are a sport fisherman's dream especially considering um around september october i believe you can haul these things out of uh 
well, out of the lake uh, close to where I grew up. I've seen pictures of like my brother has hauled one up, hold it up by the gills. It's six feet long. Shit. Jeez. Yeah. You, you yeah. had you, the, the thing is, um, and my mother would curse me until the day I die. If I, if she heard me say this, they are shit eating. See, they, they're, yeah. they're hard That's to clean. The heart to what fill stands it. out to me there is that mm -hmm. your brother could hold it up and the thing is six feet long and he could stand and hold it. Dude, do you know how tall he is? <laughs> I, Actually, well, I, know would... how t I have a rough idea how tall Dallin is and I think I remember him saying his brother's taller. So uh, th That's one brother. The other brother, not quite, but he can hold his hand up and he is a tough son of a bitch. All right, fair enough. Yeah. So we learned a little something about family. That's good. That's and good. fishing. And fishing. All right. Um, I told the I told the crew that we've got uh, we've got some really 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 great news that uh, we're going to feed you guys as soon as I get done with my opening. But um, I I do want to go ahead and remind you if you are watching live, and of course we are hoping that you are, please feel free to take advantage of the live chat system that is on the screen. I don't remember which side it's. I used to. You can you can put it on any side you want to if you pop it out. I, I, but see, the, the problem with it is it, some people do, some people don't. For me, my live chat is over on this side of my screen. So you, I don't know where it is. It, it could uh, it could be underneath, usually, it could be next. I don't care. I usually put it on my left just because it's... I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Mine's over here. And is yeah. your left my left? My yeah. My left is that way. Yeah, port starboard, I don't care. It's up to high. <laughs> Devin, I see you over there. Devin, thank you very much. It doesn't really much matter. We I don't even see the chat. Don't don't worry about it. Don't gotcha. worry about it. We will we will take care of that for you. That's kind of my job. Sweet. Anyway, let me go ahead and get everything started over here for uh for tonight's show. Um and I, I will I will let you know I don't really like doing this particular this particular opening. So at five minutes on the clock, your five minute freestyle starts now. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I really don't like this one. Everyone loses. Wow. Um, yeah, you, you guys know, I, I hate, I hate making this show completely about my country. I really don't want to do that. And uh, th I, the more things go, the, the less uh, wiggle room I've got for it, except for what's going to happen afterwards, but be that as it may, uh, what's, what's been going on? Well, uh, what kind of stirred this whole damn thing up is that there are way 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 too many uh sexual harassment claims that are going on right now and by way too many i mean more than zero all right let's just make sure that we're completely clear about that and i've stated that on many occasions any number over zero on this angle is too damned many but that goes for a lot of things here in my country that we just put up with on a daily basis uh school shootings anyone I'm sorry, was that a little bit too soon? How long would you like me to wait? Yeah, while you're thinking about this one, let's go ahead and talk about this. Well, coffee, first off, is a good thing. We have harassment claims against a lot of people right now in uh, public life. And yeah, I, I can go ahead and I can say that public life also includes show business because, well, what are you going to do? You guys are out there, your faces are out there, your names are out there. Granted, they're not your real names, but you know, be that as it may. Let's 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 start off with uh let's start off with the big one right now. Roy Moore. People claiming up, down, left, right that these claims are 30, 40 years old, so uh, that we shouldn't hold them to any kind of standard nearly as much because, A, statute of limitations, so we can't go ahead and, and pull this into the court of law because statute of limitations. But at the same time, how many times do you have to see plumes of smoke coming up before you're going to go ahead and go, you know what? That might be thermite. I, I could be wrong, but it could be thermo. Could be something else, but it, it, it's it, it's definitely something that's you know a fire kind of thing. Think about that one. So we've got that one, and this is this is this is delicious to me because this sob who has been ousted, fired from a, a, a job in the jury twice, 
for misconduct, including going ahead and saying, you know, the highest court in the land, you know, fuck them. They don't, they, what they think doesn't matter. We're going to do things our way down here, my way, because I said it. What a dick. Anyway, the point of it, though, is that people are going ahead and saying 30, 40 years later, who's going to remember? And why should we expect any kind of, all right, fine. You know what? You guys want to go ahead and argue about that. That's fine. But I'm sorry. There's a certain point where there's just too damned many smoke plumes going on for me. And I have, I have no dog in this race because I don't live down there in Alabama. Thank Thor. But here's where we lose on everything. What happens when one side decides, you know what, fine, we will uphold the ethics that we should be standing behind. We will say, you need to leave. Yes, we will take a hit on our side, but we're standing up for the right thing. Al Franken, we had the best of high hopes for him. He was somebody who we could have said that we that we said, this is a good thing. This is somebody who is surprisingly enough, really intelligent, really following up on what's going on and is willing to go ahead and take the piss out of people because of his comedy chops. So now we've got a problem because he's implicated in a number of things too now. Okay, he's finally stepping down. Conyers also stepping down. Who only knows how many others are going to end up stepping down from the Democratic side. But what's happening on the Republican side? Not much. Really, very, very little for the number of times that we've ended up having somebody who said, oh, I want to have st straight rights for all these people and the gay rights should be sticking out of the, uh, they should be staying out of the bathrooms. No, that's just a wide stance. Uh, that's, that's the way that I use a toilet. Really, people, come on. What happens when the people who are supposed to be the ethical ones on the ethical side, apparently, step down. What's left behind? Who's going to be coming in? Really, if it's the Democrats who are stepping down because it's the right thing to do, because it's the ethical thing to do, what's the guarantee that somebody is going to be replacing them who's going to be as otherwise smart or going to be in lockstep versus not? Am I advocating for people to be voting completely Democrat or completely Republican? No, not by long shot. But what happens when one group says, yeah, we'll stand up for ethics and we will kick out the people who aren't versus the ones who don't give a crap and say, doesn't matter. We'll just keep our people in there anyway. Oh, look at that. And it gives us an advantage in numbers, too. Wonderful. This is episode 191 on the docket, Your Honor. The science of sex. Sort of. Now, see, the thing of it is, with all of the stuff that's been going on with the sex scandals and the harassment, I kind of wanted to do, and really, no pun intended, a fluff piece by comparison. Because yes, we've been we've we've got all this stuff hanging over our heads, and it's just annoying, like crazy. And really, I wanted to talk with somebody who has some knowledge about, well, doing research, getting research in an area of people who are tapping. Whoever it was that turned on their microphone a couple of moments ago, there's a a a distinct tapping like there's a noise gate that's not playing nice nice so i don't know who it was apparently tech it's yours all right so we'll come back to that maybe there's a maybe there's a game thing that's going on but um was it back no actually but uh your your gain is really really on the high side and actually it is in the background at the moment all right we'll, we'll figure it out and we'll, we'll figure it from here in a minute don't worry but anyway uh Dr. Nuka, and, and occasionally I will call him that, occasionally I will call him Courtney, occasionally I will call him Nuka, I have 
we have we have seen each other uh, over several years at Anthrocon, so we have we have familiarity. He and I uh, we've had the opportunity of talking a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, so he's going to be talking with us uh, a lot more about doing science, the soft science of psychology, and getting these kinds of results on a group in in the popular culture that kind of gets maligned improperly and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that mm -hmm. however first heretic woman we have um we have news and yeah. i i i'm very glad that you're here because i really really was afraid you weren't going to make it because i didn't want you to miss out on this big opportunity because you sent it my way hit it all right this is comes from cbc so it's not fake news people we, right we i will yeah, I will make sure that uh, I will make sure that the link is in the show notes for folks so that they can take a look at it too. Yep. And uh, I'll just start with the headline that says: "New Saudi Crown Prince offers fresh hope for Quebec family of blogger jailed since 2012." And the pertinent part says: Ensof Hader, who lives in Quebec told a news conference in Ottawa Thursday she got word from a European Parliament delegation that Badawi was on a list of people who would be forgiven by the king, but we don't know when. So apparently this is something the royal family does fairly regularly. Interesting point, they've never had a prisoner of conscience on the list before it's always been people who have been convicted of like you know actual crimes um this is they're saying it's because of the new crown prince which we mentioned before um he threw a whole bunch of uh other members of the royal family and people that had um positions of power in the government in prison not too long ago so um it this is huge um yeah there, there's not a whole lot of detail unfortunately yet but um yeah they're saying that it may have had something remember we said in the summer a delegation had gone over there and we're speaking it was a un delegation and we're going to plead uh, rafe's cause and they're saying that that may have actually done something in terms of the uh, the new prince so it's uh, pretty, uh, it just says, yeah, um, speaking alongside Hayter at a news conference, um, Erwin Colt Kotler, who's uh, been advocating for Rafe Badawi's release, said that he's hopeful the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who has taken steps to modernize Saudi Arabia, could lead the country to change its position on Badawi. So, yay! <laughs> Jeez. So, yeah. so this guy threw members of his own family in jail. Yep. Yep. Yo, 45. Draining the swamp? Exactly. Yeah. Check this guy's example out. This, you this might learn something. Might, this guy might have a clue. <laughs> Apparently, the, the guy is around 35 years old. Um, he's one of many sons of, of King Solomon, but he's been named the crown prince. He is the heir apparent and King Solomon is like 90 or something. So this guy is really, um, taking his position and starting to line things up for the way he wants things to be run. Um, they say he's the reason why women will be allowed to drive in the new year, um, <clears throat> that he is the force behind some of these changes that have come. So it, it's um, major hope that we haven't seen in a very long time. Hey, America, take notice. If you want change, vote out the old and vote in the young. Well, in, in this case, it's not a matter of voting. It, it, it's uh, name the young as the next heir apparent, and then yes. let that guy throw everybody else in jail. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna quit and rejoin if I'm getting that much static. So yeah, he, the, the, the voting is not working. Uh, he, it's, uh, it was uh, something like twelve people he threw in jail. This was like in <laughs> September, I think, um, and I think. 
like all but three or four of them were his like direct relatives holy shit <laughs> yeah yep. we will we will see how this plays out uh so those of you that are watching of course yeah uh tech and bridge uh, dropped out we'll we'll see what's happening in a couple of moments but e even so this is um i know last uh, the last couple of weeks i've been saying that you know no news would be the norm but we we knew sooner or later we'd get some news i don't know who was expecting this i can tell you i certainly was not mm -hmm. so um i'm 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 thrilled i am cautiously optimistic because well we've we've had the we've had the floor pulled out from under us before so we we can hope but even so as of the recording of tonight's show this now marks five years five months 24 days since Rafe Badawi was unjustly incarcerated for thought crime our thoughts and our hopes oh man are with you and your family right now we're still hoping and we're really hoping they're with you yeah and just, just one thing um a message to the crown prince if he's watching because you know I know he is um <laughs> Two words, buddy. Jump scare. <laughs> okay. I know no, exactly you, what you, you mean. No, you, 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 got, you got me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got that. To, to, to tell you what, let's. Hey, here's an idea. Uh, we'll do a furry jump scare. We'll smuggle a whole <laughs> bunch of purses to Saudi Arabia. We'll, we'll get into the palace and just booga booga. And that should do it. No, 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 no. Because if, if all right, most of you people who are who are watching and, and, and paying attention at this point are not going to get this reference at all. Don't worry about it. Uh, no, all we need to do is send telephone in there and she will abduct all of their souls and that will be the end of it. <laughs> and the world shall end, not with a bang, not with a whimper, but with a squeak. Like I said, <laughs> you, most of you people are not going to get that. Ask your furry friends. And if you don't know who the furry friends are, if it's not you, you know at least a couple of them. Which yeah. now brings us over to the good doctor. Doctor, like I said, um, I've been going to Anthrocon since, uh, since 2007 when I was basically told to. Uh, yeah. two, it, was two years after, uh, it was two years after my wife had died. And I was basically told, you know, get, get Tiny Tribble somewhere and come down for a weekend and that was 07 and i've been going ever since uh how long have you been doing uh the research or you know what specifically how how often or when was the, when was it the first time that you ended up at anthrocon for research and and uh, what what have you got as a general for just being at such a such an incredibly large con um okay so I personally got uh, involved in the research in 2010. I had been a furry for much longer than that, but that was our first time. That was my first time going to Anthrocon. Uh, the re another member of the research team, Dr. Grabasi, she was kind of the first person to do the research. She had been going a couple years earlier. I think she'd been going since 2007 or 2006. Um, so she'd been doing it a few years before I had. Um, but yeah, I, I jumped in around 2010 and I've been going uh, every year. I, yeah, I haven't missed a year since then. So. Wow, and that's and I guess I've been uh, every time to do research, of course. And uh, the second question, I guess, was was what have I gotten out of it, or or I think it was a well, uh, just uh, personally and professionally, uh, I I know as as the doctor, um, what has it been like for you to be at such an incredibly huge uh, convention, which I mean, five thousand people plus at this point, I mean, it, it, it's got to be somewhat daunting for you too. Um, I, I, the scientist in me is giddy at it because uh, up until that point, in my my I was a grad student when I started doing the research, and I'd been uh, running studies through the lab with undergrads. And if we get eighty people in the course of a semester to do our study, or a hundred people in the course of a semester to do our study, that was pretty good. And then uh, the first, I think, the first couple of years that we went, we got about eight hundred people in two or three days of data collection. And I, I could definitely tell my colleagues were a little bit jealous of like, wow, uh, one weekend and you got more data than uh, half the department gets combined over the course of a semester. Uh, oh, and it didn't cost you anything. It cost you a few dollars worth of paw print ribbon and uh, travel costs to Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, so that was pretty sweet. So let's let's go ahead and uh, and uh, fill in 
the actual beginning of the whole damn thing because uh, I know full well that there, there there's a lot of there's a lot of pieces that we kind of have to make sure that we've got everything filled in. So if you would, would you explain what fur science is and the IARP? I, 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 P, I forget I how the acronym P. goes. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Gervasi started this research on furry. She was the first person in, in psychology, as far as we know, to do studies on furries uh, a bunch of years ago. And when I jumped on board, it was sort of in rapid succession, two or three other people kind of joined the research team and we realized that, hey, there's a bunch of us here and uh, we're not just doing this for, you know, one-off publication, that's it. We've all got a lot of really big ideas. So let's let's make this official. And so we kind of created the team. Uh, initially, we called it the IARP, the International Anthropomorphic Research Project, uh, which we called that because it got us grant money, because people took it seriously, because it had a big, long, official sounding name. Um, after a few years, we realized that that wasn't very catchy. And so now it's just for science because it was the, a lot of people would see us at cons and go for science because they see the lab coats. And so uh, we just started calling ourselves for science and it was much catchier. Uh, and apparently we still get grant money. The Canadian government uh, gave us a quarter of a million dollar grant just this past we're, year. We're, uh, we're cool that way. <laughs> right, exactly. Yep. So uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of where it, where it came from, the name. And uh, what was the what was the original intent for uh, the the first science? Uh, well, I, I don't know exactly how to how to describe it. Uh, I guess research uh, yeah. inquiry. So we're um, so I, I guess it, it it helps to step back and say okay, so we're a team of social scientists, uh, all of whom have different backgrounds. So uh, I study fantasy, media effects, and um, a few other things, immersion. So I, I tend to come at my questions about the furry fandom from that perspective. Uh, my other colleague, Dr. Gervasi, she studies human animal interaction. So things like guides, do, guide dogs or pets and human pet interactions. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Roberts studies uh, identity growth and development. And my colleague, Dr. Rayson studies um, fan cultures. And so we all come into this project with different questions that we're interested in that all kind of share this common theme of, you know, let's ask furries. And initially it started back with Dr. Gabassi when she was trying to um, challenge the contents of a Vanity Fair article called Pleasures of the Fur uh, that came out, I think it was 2007 it came out. And people had said, oh, what's, you know, she was on, uh, she had never heard of furries before and she was mon uh, moderating a forum of anthrozoologists and someone said, oh, has anyone heard of these furry things? And she'd never heard about it. So she Google she made the mistake of Googling furry and she found this Vanity Fair article and she said that, that seems kind of sketchy and, and not right, and there's no data on it. So she tried, you know, looking through the literature, couldn't find anything. And so, like any good curious scientist, she said, "Well, let's go study them." And just coincidentally, the well, the world's largest furry convention just happened to be a drive away from her. So uh, she set out to uh, put a lot of the misconceptions to the test, and she's been kind of doing it ever since. And that's kind of where the whole line of research started: is, is sort of uh, answering questions. Uh, and, and addressing misconceptions. So now there's uh, there's one misconception that uh, I want to go ahead and get to straight away, and it's not the one that a whole bunch of other people would want to get to. And yeah, it's 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 one that we kind of have to deal with the uh, multicolored cat in the room. I <laughs> want to here's here's the question, and I and I I have to pose it to you <laughs> because of the way that everything is. Mm -hmm. Even though that you are currently showing yourself with the avatar of yourself in the yeah. uh, in, a, in a fursuit head, with what a, does appear to be a lab coat uh, of, about your shoulders, mm -hmm. are you actually a serious scientist? Even though <laughs> you've got a fursuit and ears and, and multicolored blue fur, uh, yes. So despite my my appearance uh, in the picture, I am I, I do have a. a a PhD and a postdoc for that matter in social psychology. I went to the University of Waterloo. I'm a, a full-blown proper scientist, so to speak. Um, I do statistics, I, I, I run studies. Um, doing the furry research is only sort of a, a cross-section of what I do. I also study media violence effects. I also study fantasy and immersion into media. Um, I teach university courses. So yeah, I, I do uh, the whole academic rigmarole. Um, I just have fun with it. I think uh, it's important to do research that you enjoy. And so I like video games and, and furry stuff. So I study video games and furry stuff. 
video By the games way, rule. I I also went to UW. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Yes. There is absolutely fact, I, nothing wrong with uh, if you can do what you love and make money at it. So much the better. Hell yeah. <laughs> you want to study some real <laughs> behavioral patterns? Play Rust. <laughs> I, I've been wanting to actually. I've been wanting to study. I I, I thought about doing a study of 4chan years ago because that interested me. I thought about doing studies on yeah. I've ooh 4chan. Well, <laughs> if I was like some kind of uh, psychologist, I, I mean like an actual <clears throat> medically accredited psychologist uh, or sociologist or any of that stuff, I would have had a I would have had one hell of a paper that I would have been able to write up. Uh, by playing Rust, because I did an experiment for about six months in Rust, where I went onto a server where everybody was just like hostile and toxic and everything, and I created just like a house while everybody else was building bases, and I was putting up signs here. This is free. Take this. Share. Uh, you know, donation bin, uh, and, and just basically everything. And for a little while, for like the first week, it kept getting literally blown up, and then slowly as the weeks went by. Everybody would, they'd all be hostile to each other. But when they came over to my place, they all calmed down. They all, you know, it's like gathering around a fire and kicking back some beers and such kind of thing. It was really weird. <laughs> and as a social psychologist, that's right up my alley. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess. Well, as I was gonna say, I guess I should point out. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of psychologists. So I'm not. Uh, I, I say, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't prescribe medication. I'm not a a clinical psychologist, so I don't uh, listen to people's problems. I don't get paid to listen to people's problems. I don't typically care about people's problems. Uh, I'm 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 a nerdy scientist. I may put a person into a room or put two people into a room and watch through a piece of double pane glass to see what they do uh, and take notes and run statistics and and screw with people in, in experiments. That's really what I. You want to uh, know what, what makes people tick? Yeah, yeah, in a in a very weird kind of uh, uh, demented mad scientist kind of way. <laughs> I, I understand that completely because that's what I was doing. I was basically trolling everybody by not playing it the way everybody else had decided to play it because there was no rules for that particular game as to what the goal is. You do whatever you want. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there, There's no true rules except for the physics in the game itself. So mm -hmm. I was trolling them by behaving completely different than everybody was expecting. It was that's, great. That's a beautiful thing. Now, um, to... To kind of go along with the uh, uh, the rust aspect, um, the the good doctor and I have, uh, like I said, uh, we've seen each other for several years over at Anthrocon. Uh, I do pop over at the uh, uh, over at the table every once in a while. Sometimes I've actually remembered to turn in my questionnaire form. Uh, you can I've do had, the one that's online right now. <laughs> yes. Well, we're we're, we're going to get to that because I need to make sure that I get the, the when uh, when does that uh, when does that one finish off? Um. I think we have a hard deadline. I was hoping to, uh, when we get to 5,000 people or uh, sometime mid-January, whichever one comes first. So, hmm. Okay. So I will make sure that uh, in the show notes, uh, I will give you guys a link over to what is the uh, uh, the current questionnaire so you can go ahead and fill that out. I haven't even done it myself yet because I've been uh, otherwise occupied, but uh, I will see about that one. Uh, and I'll see, about, uh, I'll see about dropping it over at, uh, at uh, the guys at Fernal Equinox too because, well... They're having their specialty coming up uh, shortly, but here's the here's the piece as far as to uh, you know how tech was just talking about how you know people just go ahead and shoot people just because they can and pull stuff up just because they can. Oh, and then well, the name calling. Uh, oh, that oh, was the worst part of it. Oh, oh, here, yeah. here's here's the thing. If anybody wants to think that scientists and furries and furry scientists don't get steal up their backbone to really get pissed off doc you remember i came over and i saw you at anthrocon this year and i went ahead and i said oh yeah by the way there's this article and gave you my phone and showed you i'm trying to remember what the article was i did read it i just remember what it was now i, I get I, I read a lot of articles no I, I i know i know but uh the the reason i'm bringing this one up is it was right as anthrocon was about to start and we had yet another sex sensationalized story about the furries yet again and if i remember right you basically said oh yeah send me that link i would like to hit them over the head with my research book 
Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, that comes up a lot. Uh, because one of the weird things that happens when you become the world's expert on something is that you get calls from the media or calls whenever someone wants to do a story on furries. And so, yeah, very often I find myself in the position of having to uh, teach people uh, basic research methods and teach people uh, that anecdote is not the same thing as, um, you know, data. <laughs> I think the uh, uh, CSI episode might have had a bit to do with that too. Yeah, let's 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 go down the list real quickly. Uh, oh. Let's see, Vanity Fair, <laughs> CSI, MTV, uh, Thousand Ways to Die, uh, Tyra Banks. Um, we've we've also got uh, Doctor Phil and a. You know, I, I was, I was he, actually the, the doc an episode oh. on 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 the, on the subject of the Doctor Phil one real quick. I want to mention. Um, I didn't think that one was too bad. And part of the reason why it wasn't so bad was because uh, a few days before the episode aired, I got a phone call from Dr. Phil's executive producer who said, uh, we would like you to write up a, uh, a one-page summary of the research on furries that we can hand to Dr. Phil so he knows what he's talking about, about furries. <laughs> and so my, my, my instructions and what I put on the top of that page was treat furry the way you would treat model train enthusiasts in that it's a hobby and that's about all it is. Yeah. And uh, to his credit, when you listen to him on the show, his, his point when dealing with this 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 particular uh, case, this particular person, was to say to the mother, look, it's just a hobby. You know, it, it's it's the furry isn't the problem. And I was very I was very proud. Uh, that's cool. Because I felt like I, I influenced that. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I have dabbled in watching a little Dr. Phil as a gu guilty pleasure. Um, he's a bit of a dork but <laughs> yeah i i when you said that i was like oh geez i have visions of him like just going to town on it so it, it's good that he got a clue and treated it like a normal thing yeah <laughs> well i attended a con um a couple of years ago not not too far from here actually it's a uh, fur a it, it's a newer con uh that's come out of the past years <clears throat> um and this was the, yeah, this was the first one that I'd gone to with uh, my fursuit, uh, just a partial. And we were doing, we were doing the parade and um, it was actually kind of amazing. Uh, a lot of the people that were coming up and just talking to us, like, you know, what is this? What's this about? And um, they, they weren't insulting. They, they weren't uh, standoffish. They, they, they actually gave me the impression that they were genuinely curious. Mm -hmm. which was really nice, I have to say. Well, the typical response that we get a lot of the time, especially when I try to explain my research to people, is people are either, like, if they've never heard of it before, they're just kind of confused. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only a small percentage of people who have misconceptions. Now, they tend to be pretty bad or pretty inaccurate misconceptions, but I think a lot of people um, either have no idea or, and I guess maybe I'm, I'm very sympathetic here to people, um, a lot of times the misconceptions come out of that's the only information they've heard and they're going off the best information that they know. Yeah. Um, there are plenty of things that I that I see in the world where I just kind of assume, oh, that's a, a weird person or that's some weird kink fetish thing um, because I don't know better. And if I, if, I, if I was seeing a furry for the first time, I would probably make the exact same assumption and not think twice about it. Yep. And <laughs> how many times have I said on this show, guys, seriously, how many times <laughs> you were taught wrong? Hey, uh, can I add something to the conversation? Do it. Do it. All right. I remember the first time I saw furries, and I had no idea what the hell I was looking at. And I remember my initial thoughts on that, too. Do you know what they were? Can you guess? Mm -hmm. Crazy or it's a sex thing? No. I was like, oh, cool. They like to get dressed up in costumes. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I, I think I was like 12 or 13 maybe at the time. Yep. And it so, was just, it was like three or four people. One, one looked like a cat. One looked like it was either a fox or a dog or something. I don't, I don't remember clearly the costumes. But I just thought it was a bunch of people who got dressed up in costumes like you would on Halloween, except they had like really good costumes. Yeah. My, my favorite one, though, was uh, at the same convention, one of these ladies was talking about cosplay. You know, because they they had apparently they'd been to a Star Trek convention or some other sci-fi thing where people would dress up as, you know, a Starfleet officer or a Jedi Knight 
or if you go to the comic convention, um, I saw a Master Chief outfit. I don't even want to guess how much money the guy put into that thing. I don't want to guess what kind of <laughs> chafing that would cause. No, like, I don't think made for you could make a suit that expensive um, with animatronics. I'm serious. That That's how good this thing looked. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's but, a, it's a, yeah, go ahead. Talk. Yeah. But the lady asked, you know, like, you know, is this some kind of cosplay? And I said, kind of. And mm -hmm. she says, she says, what do you mean? And I said, well, you go to a convention and people are cosplaying their favorite characters on a TV show or on a cartoon. Nine times out of 10, when it comes to a furry convention, what you're cosplaying is a character of your own design. So like you're, you're actually cosplaying the object of your own personal creativity. Her mind was like blown when she heard that. <laughs> yep. And, and just, just to, just for the folks that are <laughs> listening and not watching. Yes. I do still have my, my, Starfleet jacket of sorts uh, here. And you got the good one. Uh, <laughs> not exactly. Mm -hmm. it, no, no. From a design perspective. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll and now about the that. arguments begin. No, no. Here, and, and, actually, here's. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Wait. Does that happen in the furry community? People just... argue about who makes the best like oh, material. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Heretical? I was just going to say, I still have my red shirt with the hand embroidered insignia on it. Okay. I so, embroidered myself. <laughs> okay. So, um, we're going to start talking about uh, a couple of statistics, and then we're going to kind of get into the meta of how do you actually get this stuff? Because that's the piece that's going to be most important to me for what we're going to end up talking to. So, let's go ahead and get rid of some of these misconceptions, which actual numbers. So, Doctor, you, <laughs> obviously, from your icon, you have a fursuit of your own. Dallin has already said he has his. I, surprisingly enough, uh, back in 2009, when the uh, when the uh, when Anthrocon's theme was "Oh my God, aliens," I did actually make a horrible um, fursuit for a Tribble. Don't ask. <laughs> Seriously, don't ask. But how it, in in the furry fandom of which it's a a, a I, I don't know what kind of a, a slice of, of percentage of the population. How how many people or or what percentage of people would tend to have actual costumes? Yeah, so that's that's actually one of the big misconceptions that a lot of people have. People kind of def a lot of people define furries as people who wear fur suits, and that would be a lot like defining uh, sports fans as people who wear sports jerseys. Um, that's not the defining feature. Some fans will wear those things, but. Many don't, uh, and in the furry fandom, depending on the sample you're using, it's between 15 and 25 percent. Typically, less than 20 percent. So uh, we're talking about you know most furries don't wear fur suits, just like you know most uh, people who watch Game of Thrones probably don't own a Game of Thrones T-shirt, or most people who are sports fans don't necessarily own a uh, sports jersey. Um, some people like to express their interest that way. Hold hold on a second. We we had a little bit of a network hiccup. Could you go ahead and say this last part again? Um, oh god, what did I just say? Uh, some <laughs> people like to express their uh, interests that way. Others don't. Fair enough. And um, like I said, uh, I'm one of those people that tried. It was horrible. It got the point across when people actually looked at it. Although I did have a number of people who said. Wait a minute! Wasn't that 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 character that was on the the cartoon of uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes? Yeah, the the fuzzy, whatever. You know what? It's fine, fine. Now, believe it or not, the entirety of the uh, the Tribble uh, costume, if you will, is a, a red headband. That's kind of indicative of it, and everybody recognizes the freaking headband, which is fine by me. <laughs> but um, as far as to uh, as far as to the arguments over who has the best suit or who's the best designer or best builder or whatever something tells me that this is one of those things that is that you don't exactly cover but i'm sure that you've heard anecdotally back and forth about a whole bunch of different people who do or are crap at it or have tried yeah so there's a few sort of intersecting questions that are actually of interest to us so one of so we don't actually have the answer to the question who makes the best fursuits um, but we do know that this is a thing that furries do 
occasionally debate about or you know this the subjective preference you know people will like this artist or that artist this builder or that builder um very recently just this most uh recent survey at anthrocon we have started to look into things like who is your favorite content creators who is your favorite musician within the fandom artist in the fandom uh so we're get, sort of getting our, our feet wet with those sorts of questions um if only just to kind of take the you know get your finger on the pulse of the furry fandom and see what they they believe um, but it also gets into some more interesting questions too about uh, one of the, the topics we're looking at in our recent survey that's, that's up right now is something along the lines of say gate gatekeeping or you know people deciding you know what counts as furry what doesn't count as furry who are the real furries who are the elite furries and so that becomes an issue as well you know do you have a fursuit is it a homemade fursuit or did you go out and get a, a, you know a quote-unquote real one from a quote-unquote real fursuit builder and um I'm kind of thankful to say that at least anecdotally what I'm seeing is that um, furries don't tend to be that snobbish or elitist. There's a little bit of that there, but not to the same extent that you see in perhaps other fandoms that are a little more centralized or where there's um, a far smaller proportion of content creators or builders, where there's only a handful of really elite ones. The furry fandom tends to be much more distributed. And speaking of which, uh, Dallin is going ahead and sharing. Uh... Yeah. This is uh, this is the partial ah. that I had done. Um, also, shout out to Scott Sigler because I'm wearing my uh, Ionath Krakens uh, T-shirt with it uh, to show that you know not not all GFL fans are human. Uh, <laughs> this was actually this uh, suit was uh, commissioned and designed and built by a local talent. Uh, her name's she goes by Temperance, uh, also known as uh, Comic Crazy Studios. She has done some incredible work. Um, she's done a fair number of the suits uh, around my own little community. Uh, she also had two uh, German Shepherd fur suits shipped down to Australia for a music video by a by a local uh, rock band. Uh, the song, eh, not that great. The video, awesome. Uh, just because, well. Again, I, I know the artist. Um, and actually, just recently, a Midwest Fur Fest, or MF, MFF, uh, just wrapped up, uh, what was it, a couple weeks ago? Yep. <clears throat> There's a picture uh, that was circulating. I think it's still on Furfinity. Um, apparently, all the fursuiters uh, who had a suit designed by Made For You, I just mentioned them earlier tonight, uh, they took a picture. It looks like they were the majority of the parade. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, like a very uh, made for you. Apparently, has really exploded in terms of popularity. Um, I also know, like, like you said, Nuka. There's, there's not a lot of. Uh, I, I do hear the odd barb about uh, one fursuit maker versus another, but it actually has very little to do with. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's, it's got nothing to do with the design of the suit. It's far far more petty than that um but there was a blog i don't know if it's around anymore but it was um awful fursuits or something like that and it was people who would submit pictures that they would take at cons of suits that were just absolutely you know wtf and uh their one of their live journal yeah this is how old it is it was a live journal icon wow yeah, the, the icon they used was actually the head of a fursuit that belonged to a friend of mine. Ooh. I knew the guy who owned it, uh -oh. and I knew the guy who designed it. And there was some legal stuff going on because of that. Ken says, I blame uh, you. Uh, really quickly, before we pass off on that one, uh, it, also Temperance ended up having uh, a suit made for a local uh, government agency, no? Yes, Stompy the Triceratops. <laughs> Um, one of the things our local community used to do was, um, we would, uh, do events at the zoo. We would actually on, on certain days, uh, the fursuiters or what was better known as a, what are they called? Wild Rose Critters. That's the formal name. Kind of a, it's a mascotting company. And that's actually how I got to meet a lot of the, the locals here was, uh, I was their, their handler, you know, the, the safety man. Uh, Nuka, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to it being a handler. Yep. Yep. And what happens <laughs> when you don't have one? 
Oh, believe me, I still have to get the eye holes fixed on mine a little bit because I can't see a damn thing out of that thing. <laughs> and, of course, no handlers in the fursuit parade. We all know what that means. I've, I've yet to fall over, but that's not to say it can't happen. I don't get it. Well, you, yeah. well, you, should, you should see what? the feet. It's, it's like walking with flippers. But anyways. You don't want to fall over in that, dude. No, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Like a turtle on your back trying to get back up. And... Yeah. I was going to say, that's where you need that sign. I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> Some more than others. Anyways. Um... Hey, there's an idea, a, 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 like a life alert, but for fursuiters. I've fallen over somewhere. <laughs> Can someone come and stand me up? <laughs> I could float that to a few people and it could get done. So, like, don't <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Go for yeah. it. I'm not even. I don't even know any fursuiters other than you guys. So, <laughs> well, Anyways. just to, yeah, just to make it real quickly uh, about uh, about Stompy, real quick. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Calgary Zoo had a had a dinosaur park. Uh, Stompy was there for the grand opening. It's a it's a blue blue and purple triceratops. The suit has now been donated to the Royal Tyrell Museum. <laughs> as their mascot and just so you know the royal Tyrell museum is like one of the foremost paleontol pale paleontological museums in north america because drum heller the badlands it's a fossil gold mine yeah we talked about that last night exactly and that, that's one thing i forgot to mention is that's where the Tyrell museum is and that is where stompy now resides again uh, I cool. yeah that was I, huge I, I will make sure that we've got links for as much of this stuff as we can find for you guys for uh, for later. Now, we've had a little bit of fun kind of filling in some of the gaps, but now we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into like the meta part about a lot of this stuff. Because we can't get away from the damned answer or the question as much as we try. So let's just get it out there and get it over with and just be done with it and then move the hell on. The sex part, which has driven us up a freaking wall since Tyra Banks. The the questionnaires that you guys uh, have put out at con and and besides Anthrocon, by the way, which which other which other conventions have you guys uh, surveyed? So we've done research at uh, Texas Furry Fiesta every year uh, since 2011, I believe. They've been very supportive of our work. Uh, we've also, we used to do it at Oaklacon before Oaklacon went under. Uh, we did it two or three years there. And I think recently we've started doing it at Fernal Equinox as well in Toronto. And we're trying to make inroads at a few other cons as well, including uh, Furay here in Edmonton. Uh, and hopefully someday uh, MFF and maybe even uh, West Further Confusion as well. I would, I would very much like to see you in Toronto, man. That, this could be great. Anyway, <laughs> so... Um, so the sex part is is something that constantly comes up as a huge, a, uh, no pun intended, but it is a huge bone of contention for us in this community because that's the big broad brush we get painted with. Yep, and, and CSI didn't help matters on that one. Oh, I was going to say, you, you mean yiffing isn't a thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um. Part of it comes from the fact that when, when we see something, you know, as humans, when we see something we don't understand, we immediately jump to one of two explanations because we naturally want to explain weird behavior. And so the, the explanation is almost always there's something wrong with that person's head or it's some freaky sex thing. And that's not unique to furries. Well, you know, whatever it is, you see some weird person doing something yep. on the street that you don't understand, you either think that person is is missing a few you know bolts somewhere up there or they're they're getting something they're getting off on this somehow and so you know, i would argue that even without the csi episode even without tyra banks or vanity fair um the, there would be these assumptions in people these very natural assumptions because it is unusual behavior and oftentimes <laughs> unusual behavior is is indicative of something something not not quite right or um you know Sex is a weird thing to us, and so we, we tend to go in that direction. So yeah, it's something that we, uh, a, a misconception we encounter quite often, and I can sort of dispel it. I, I'm quite used to dispelling it at this point. Um, I don't know if that's where you're going with that, if you wanted me to go there, or if you wanted to. By all means, feel free. Okay. 
So um, the, the, the one thing I'll point out is that there is pornography in the furry fandom. Perhaps that is the least surprising statement in existence. Uh, but gasp, pornography exists in the furry fandom. And a lot of people make the, the jump from that to say, therefore, it's a fetish. Because furry porn exists, therefore, furry is a fetish. And that would make sense if it didn't sound so damn absurd uh, in any other context. So I, I always use these as examples. I say um, there is pornography you know, uh, in the anime fandom, you know, hentai. And we wouldn't say that a person who likes anime is a person with an anime fetish just because anime porn exists, even if they enjoy anime porn. That doesn't mean that their entire fanship is based around that pornography. Um, if you open up the, the 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 front page or look at the front page of any car magazine, there's typically a model draped across the hood of the car. We wouldn't say that car fans are people with a car fetish. Um, you know, you go to sporting events and there are typically cheerleaders there, and you wouldn't say, well, that person has some kind of football fetish because there's cheerleaders at a at a you know uh, a football event. So in any other context, we we don't make the job. We, we don't say, oh, this porn of it, therefore it's a fetish except with furries that is for whatever reason people have decided that that's the case with furries even though that logic doesn't hold water in any other context and you can say well there's a lot of porn you can say well there's a lot of anime porn um the, the logic just doesn't flow and especially when you look at our data and we ask furries you know okay what drove you to the fandom what what motivates you and for the vast majority of them for all except for about five percent they say well no porn's not really what what, what drove me here? Porn's not really why I'm here. It's you know it's something that's there on the side and that's kind of cool, but I'm here for the 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 community. I'm here. I, I like the community. I like the sense of belongingness it provides. I've for many of them it's I've often uh, I've grown up with loving this stuff, and so as an adult I still love this stuff. You know, if you like science fiction, what's better than taking the science fiction you've always loved and throwing an attractive looking character? Into it. If you love football, what's better than football and attractive looking people on the field while you're watching your game of football? If you like cars, what's better than an attractive looking model draped across your favorite car? Um, so we recognize this distinction in other interests, but not with furries. I think that this is pure <laughs> speculation, mind you. Um, as somebody who is not a furry, looking in, you know, looking at it from the outside view, but with other interests um it might have something to do with the fact that people are seeing the costumes and thinking oh they like to get dressed up like you know role play in the bedroom kind of thing but you yeah. would make this but we don't make the same assumption with cosplay you don't see cosplayers at an anime convention and say oh some people do <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, yeah. Oh, there's a whole lot of people I know that definitely think cosplay is. Uh, well, someone, someone was mentioning the, someone was mentioning the master, the master chief costume earlier, and mm -hmm. I, I, I would wager that uh, very few people saw that and said, "Boy, that person's probably walking around just getting off to being in that master chief costume, where they're going to do some kinky things with that thing uh, in the bedroom okay. later on." I, Not I with that cut no piece, no I, fucking way. <laughs> I have no idea what Master Chief looks like. Give me a second. I've never heard of him before. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Uh, well, wait a minute. It's, it, it's, it also could be a her. Okay, the well, program for women, um, too. It I said master, which is yeah, usually well, a well, masculine. But. Well, no. Um, Actually, Master Chief is a Marine designation. Oh, okay. So, and that, that's, yeah, that's what it comes that's from. That's how clueless. That's how yeah. clueless. I no, know. It, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. worst, worst case scenario, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll make in the show notes. I'll do the, the, the Master Chief versus Leonidas. By the way, Leonidas wins. Spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's a picture. This is the, the main character. Oh, yeah. Game. There ain't nothing sexy about that thing. <laughs> um, yeah. But the thing is, you. The, uh, well, the, the voice actor who does the voiceover. For the master chief has got a very deep voice where okay some people might get a little tingly sen sensation let's just say okay <clears throat> actually um, you know what that reminds me of the first time i ever saw a sex scene in a movie was excalibur and uh uh what's his name Uther. Uther didn't didn't take his armor off <laughs> no he did not i have absolutely no idea what you're talking about Yes, well, actually, yes. <laughs> right. If I, if I could make one, if I could one more one more analogy to sort of show the absurdity of this. Um, sure. Star Trek fans, 
uh, there's a, uh, you know, for 40 years, or, or I guess it's closer to 50 years now, I guess yeah. Star Trek has been uh, a staple of science fiction. And yet, um, for, for those who are sort of in the know or who've been in the fandom for, for quite some time, you're, you're very familiar with the uh, idea of uh, Kirk and Spock fan fiction. And that was a big driving force, uh, especially for women in the fandom. That was a huge driving force of a lot of the fan fiction in the fandom. And yet, you would be, it'd be you know, it would be foolish to look at a Star Trek fan and say, "Boy, they got a weird Star Trek uh, uh, fetish. They're going to put on Starfleet uniforms and get it on." And maybe some do, and there's nothing wrong if they do. But it would seem really weird to say that you know a Star Trek fan is a person with a Star Trek fetish. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, the one I always bring up, no, the, the one I bring up when somebody starts talking to me about furry fandom and sex, I, I just say, look, dude, I got three words for you. Orion, slave girl. Oh, yes. I can drop the mic after that, and then every they know exactly what I'm talking about. Going, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. You know? <laughs> or Star Wars, Princess Leia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, and, and I've seen, I, I, I've shamefully seen art with lightsabers being used in ways that really shouldn't be used um oh heck okay uh, let, let's just let's just clear the air real quick uh go to Pornhub or something like that and do search for princess leia it, it, it you're done yeah yeah okay well you, you guys know i've talked about the star trek porn before i i have yeah. a collection so, yeah so i mean it, it only for the lols <laughs> Yeah, but I think what it is that's with, what helps you sleep at night. Yeah, I, I I think what it is with the with the fandom though is that like you've talked about sports teams, you've talked about cars, you've talked about Star Trek, Star Wars, established um, characters. I, I guess like like in other words, like in the furry fandom, you basically create yourself. You, you create a persona, your own identity. Yep. And I think that's where the, uh, to me, that, that seems to be where the biggest separation is, is that there are very few characters that you could, there's no canon to the family. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've got your staples, you've got your, your zigzag, you've got your, um, uh, yeah, you see, there we go. I've been in the, I've been in and out of this family for about 17 years. I can't rattle off more than maybe a couple of three staple characters that I know of. And if I were to mention those to, you know, somebody, you know, half my age, God, I can't believe I just said that. Um, <laughs> they'd probably wonder who the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. Like I, I say the word zigzag and uh, like, should you know who I'm talking about? You probably yeah. know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I've I've met the artist Max Blackrab, but I actually have a a, a piece done by him. Um, <clears throat> but to mention a certain artist or a certain character, th there's not a lot of things to hang on to. So when you go into the fandom like that, you're not going in to to imitate somebody. You're actually being yourself, and I think that's the largest departure from the fandom compared to other. Um, the other things you mentioned there. Yes, uh, to some extent. So that's actually one of the things we've actually published a paper just a, a short while ago. Oh, wow. <laughs> on that idea of um, different fandoms, uh, or one of the things that make furry, furry is relatively unique is this, this, you create your own content, you create your own character, but it's not totally unique to the furry fandom. So for example, if you go into say the steampunk community, yeah. um, I would argue that, you know, if you go into the, everything from like, uh, SCA, or the SCA, Society for Creative um, Anachronisms, the guys who do Civil War reenactments. Uh, and very often they, they, they don't necessarily uh, create characters who are based on real characters, but they create sort of their own character within that time, who could exist within that time. Um, so not unique to the furry fandom, but it is one of the things that we suggest makes the furry fandom sort of a closer knit community, a more accepting community because of this norm, because uh, it's not my show is better than yours or, or my my particular artist is better than yours. It's we all come from different mm -hmm. yeah, backgrounds. Yep. All right. So uh, real quick, uh, two things I want to get to. Uh, first off, yes, fine, uh, finally just joining us. Uh, thank you, Joey. Nice to, to have you. We're getting a little I was getting a little worried about you earlier. Yes. Yeah. See, 
like you were saying, your freaking microphone actually does work. Imagine Everything that. works fine on every fucking program, except for Skype, which is why Skype is no longer on my computer. Not that I wouldn't put it Don't back man. on. Not that I wouldn't put it back on. It's just that it won't go back on my computer. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, you know, we, we, yeah. No, Joey, last night um, I was Googling um, Skype Vista not working. Pl plain and simple, Skype no longer, uh, Vista is no longer supported with Skype. Yeah. And it won't but, let you install it. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that you're not alone. Oh, I know. Uh, a lot I of people know. have gone. <laughs> and Microsoft is just like, we're not going to answer anything. Well, kind of like Google too. You know, when they Google has problems and with some of their well, uh, different programs and such, and you go to their boards and submit a request, and they're like, eh, we might. That's well, assuming you get an answer. To, to to be to be fair, it was a very specific issue, and we're going to be working through that one. But be, be that as it may, um, there's another. Uh, there's another sex thing that we we need to address before we actually get into. What <laughs> I'm the, sorry, I saw a joke. Don't worry about it. Uh, there, uh, like I said, there's there's one other sex thing that we have to address uh, before I before we actually get into, like I said, the meta part about research because this is really the big thing that we wanted to make sure that we you know, we deal into. How do I get on is, that research team? Uh, I was going to say I'm all for researching sex, you know. Well, here's here's the problem. The research that has debunked the stereotype that oh, these people who are dressing up as animals must be into let's see, what's the correct term uh, what's the correct terminology that you guys end up using for it in your research? Uh, I'm not sure what you're going to talk about. That, uh, well, uh, that that was that was one of them, but that's not the one I was actually going for. Uh, zoophilia. Zoophilia. Yep. Nay. Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't help it. <laughs> yeah, basically, um, yeah. I'll pay for it later. <laughs> so yeah, so that that is another misconception that people have is that oh, furries. If it's not a sexual attraction to doing things in a fursuit, it must be. Uh, a sexual attraction to to yeah. animals, yeah. Uh, uh, which again is kind of, which is again is kind of funny because that would be the equivalent of, um, you know, you see the uh, attractive model draped across the car, and you say, oh, they must be sexually attracted to the car. Um, well, not... there are people who did get arrested for having sex with cars. True, Dang. but again, the logic the logic just doesn't follow. <laughs> I'm trying to remember right, that. Right, the the, the 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 statistical probability of a person who enjoys looking at car magazines with women on the cars ha actually engaging in coitus with the car is incredibly low. You, you know, SNL did a skit on that once. <laughs> did not know. <laughs> I believe it was the uh, Mercury Mistress. <laughs> yes, yes. So the, the idea that, uh, that you know, you see, because you, uh, furries are, by definition, a furry is attracted to media that features anthropomorphized animals, you know, animals with human traits. And so right off the bat, you're kind of missing the point by saying, therefore, they're attracted to animals because that's not what makes furry art furry, right? It's the anthropomorphic part of the, uh, the right. equation that's kind of present there. So right off the bat, you're kind of a swing and a miss. But even if you wanted to get into the nitty gritty details, um, the best estimates we can find about prevalence in the fandom uh, puts the rate at about, oh, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers now. It, it's escaping me. Um, Close enough. Yeah, so the, so the numbers are, are, are sub 10%, which sounds kind of bad in and of itself. Wow, like that's, that, that's a, uh, and that's not people who have sex with animals, that's attraction to it, which sounds bad until you realize that when you ask the general population, you get numbers that are about, you know, around 10%. <laughs> so statistically, they don't actually differ from one another. <laughs> um, yes. You in the back. Yes, Joe. <laughs> oh, I was I was just waiting my turn. It sounded like you you were on a roll. I'm not going to interrupt. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I was just I was just going to say yeah. The the evidence suggests that. Uh, and again, they're not they're not. It's not great data because it's a really hard topic to study. Um, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that statistically there are any differences between furries and non furries in terms of prevalence of zoophilia. Uh, my apologies uh, for the. <clears throat> that was actually me coughing because I smoke, not because. Oh, I was trying to interrupt you. No worries. So, uh, so here's now, here's now the meat and potatoes of the whole damn thing. 
doing research is not an easy thing to do. And as as uh, uh, I'll step in and say, it's easy to do research. It's hard to do good research in social psychology. Uh, 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 fair enough, yeah, Joe. But the difference between fucking around and science is writing it down. Thank you. <laughs> now, if if I may, I, since I uh, since I am a little late, if I may interject for just a moment, there are a few things I'd like to say on this matter. Might as well just do it. I I, I hang out with furries. I go to furry conventions. I. I don't know if I consider myself one or not. You know what? I don't care. It's fun to hang around. Now, what? I I am not going to comment on. I lost my pips. You're fine. Pips. No, there you, they are. Um, I'm not going to comment on the sexuality of you know the furry fandom because. Uh, in the words of one Samuel Conway, a lot of the folks who go to these conventions are college kids. And it might surprise you, but college kids sometimes think about sex. <laughs> Number two, I guarantee you there is somebody <clears throat> with green body paint at a Star Trek convention and someone dressed <laughs> up like Captain Kirk. Thank you. Yeah. I feel so just. <laughs> I I I, I kind of pounded that nail earlier tonight, Jill. But uh, yeah. thank you, thank you for confirming. I, I figured somebody it. had. But <laughs> number th number three, the whole you know sex with fursuits things. Look, I've given up on sex. I, I consider myself asexual. I don't like guys. I don't like girls. Everybody pisses me off equally. <laughs> The idea of having sex while wearing what is effectively a sofa <laughs> is not that appealing to me. Let alone the fact that a lot of these people pay upwards of, you know, several hundred to several thousand dollars for yeah. these for these items. Uh, that that partial I showed earlier cost me a grand. Yeah, and yeah. and um for the, for those that are are, for I'd rather be spending that on computer parts. Yeah, uh, I I gotta I gotta put this into the into the show notes again too. Uh, there is there is one first suitor that I know I, I've known a long time. Nice guy, Cryo Wolf. Yep, the Cryo Wolf suit is currently in the fifteen grand range, U.S. <laughs> And uh, I will I will find and link in a picture of Cryo Wolf because his is gorgeous. It's a sweet I, I, suit. Again, I would say that I would want to rather spend that on computer parts. Exactly. It's it's a question of your priorities. Uh, at the time that I dropped the grand on my partial, I didn't need computer parts, and even today I still don't. I've been running the same computer for about seven years now, and the only thing I've changed out is the video card. And well, I was, that's what I was talking about. Those things are expensive now. Well, yeah, especially the new uh, the new GeForce one. Christ, uh, what is the new uh, either Jedi or Sith? Uh, Twelve hundred bucks US a pop for a video card. Uh, actually, uh, actually, that, that, the one that just came dropped three. <clears throat> Um, in the in, in the graphic industry, there are video cards that start at five thousand. Yeah, look, unless I'm doing a full blown professional three D rendering and I work for Pixar, that ain't gonna happen. Like I said, I was talking about that fifteen thousand. Yeah, yeah, Joe, real quick, and then uh, I'm gonna yeah. move this in. My my last item. So why do I hang out with with furries? Because why do I? Why do I consider myself one? Why do I go to the conventions and such? Well, here's the simple truth of it. They're nice folks. They accept me for who the hell I am, which I can't say everybody does. And as somebody who spent eight years in the military, none of them yet has tried to shoot or shank my ass. <laughs> Despite was, your best efforts. With with one exception of a chlorine thing, but that's different. 
yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the close look the closest thing that ever happened to that i punched him in the head the year i met him but it was requested oh yes i asked him to punch me in the head how's that hand doing down <laughs> <laughs> It's still good. All right, I can still so, write. <laughs> okay, so let's kind of let's kind of talk about um, what goes into doing research in this particular setting. Um, yeah. We know full well that typically when you're doing scientific research, you want to get the best possible data that you can. And like you said, you ended up with 800 submissions and and however many it is that you get per year at this point with Anthrocon. And like I said, Anthrocon is fast approaching if it hasn't already broken 8,000 people and no, no stop in sight at the moment for increasing numbers. But we also know full well, you're dealing with, forgive me, the soft sciences and you're putting through a questionnaire, which is, of course, slightly biased of self-reported data. Yep. Um, how, when you're, when you're dealing with this, which would otherwise seem, for a lot of skeptics who aren't in the know, for stuff that would seem to be very malleable and very maybe necessarily unreliable because of those pieces, <laughs> uh, how, do you, how do you take that all into account and... and 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 make sure that you've actually got proper information. Yeah, so that's actually sort of a question about psychology in in general. Uh, and one of the first things we do whenever we teach psychology courses is we start off with a couple of weeks just on science theory. Um, and, and I would argue that what a lot of people call a soft science, we uh, I, I consider a multivariate science, um, in the sense that so if you're doing physics. Uh, in any given, you know, you try to control a bunch of things in an, any given setting, you're looking at a, a handful of variables, you know, maybe in a really complex simulation, you're looking at 10 or 12 different variables uh, that account for, you know, 99% of the variance in the behavior of, a, of an object or something. Uh, if you're getting into chemistry, if you're getting into biology, you're adding on a few more variables, and maybe your model looks at, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 variables that account for 50% of the variance or 60% of the variance in something. Uh, when you're dealing with people, we're just tacking on more variables. You know, now we're in the realm of you know thousands or millions of variables that you know you know, and our, our models have more noise in them. You know, instead of predicting a person's behavior, fifty percent of the variance in it, maybe we're happy with being able to present or to uh, predict ten percent of the variance in a person's behavior, which doesn't sound terribly impressive um, when you're looking at a single individual. But if you consider, at least myself as a social psychologist, we look at group behavior. Right, so you know, you plunk a furry down in front of me, and I can't tell you much about them. You give me a thousand furries, and I'll tell you what that group of furries is likely to, how they're likely to behave, what sorts of demographic composition they're going to have, uh, the sorts of trends they're going to see in this group, how they're going to interact with other groups, because we're talking about you know large scale, um, large numbers of people, and that ten percent variance suddenly becomes very impactful at large sort of scale. So that's sort of one. One issue right off the bat, when calling it a soft science, I would think of it as a its a more multivariate science. Um, but we do follow, oh, sorry, did you want to jump in there? Well, I was going to say the uh, the most interesting part of um, the studies that I had in college, like the sociology, the statistics, and everything else that all added up, the part that interested me the most, which kind of surprised me that there was no like specialized course on it, was always the outliers. There were always something somewhere way out there. It's just like, what what caused that one? Why is that so far out there? Why is this one over here? Why are these spread apart like this? You know, what's <laughs> causing this? And they never focused on that. It was always in the middle of the group. Here's the well, biggest results and the most common results, and that's what we're looking for. It's like, but that's not unique to psychology. I mean, let's say you run I a physics. See the outliers. Well, let's say you run a physics experiment and you're trying to measure the speed of gravity by dropping objects. And maybe on one of, you know, maybe a gust of wind comes at the, at the wrong time. And so you got this one point that's just way the hell out of there because, you know, your object was rather light and the wind took it in a really weird trajectory. Um, if, you're, if, if your goal is to try to understand, you know, the, the speed of gravity or rather the acceleration due to gravity, you're not interested in the one goofy outlier. You're trying to find a law. You're trying oh, no, to no, find no, 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 trying to, yeah. I, I wasn't saying that it's ignored. I was just saying, I always found it interesting that everybody else was always looking for, you know, the group, whereas I tended to focus on, um, despite what maybe the assignment was, I would get, uh, my brain would become interested in the outliers. Yeah. 
Right. So I can so, only imagine what you have seen. <laughs> yes. Remember, um, folks, the Coriolis effect does not account for Acme anvils. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to get back to the, the boring research part for a second, too, um, it's also sort of it's the same science that you do in any other field. Um, so uh, the, the, I always use the example of aggression. We're going to measure someone's aggression and uh, compare that to, say, measuring their height. And, and the task is essentially the same thing conceptually. You're trying to you come up with a ruler of some sort, a measurement device, and you measure how tall a person is. Now, you might look at a psychological measure of how aggressive a person is. It's a scale of 1 to 10, how aggressive do you feel? And you might say, well, what a piece of crap instrument. Because, you know, look at all the variability in there. You know, one person might say 4, one person might say 6. Um, you know, there's variability. A person might say a 4 today and a 6 tomorrow. Um, you know, how can you do anything with that? But I would argue that there are no perfect measures. Um, we have a much wider um, sort of error when dealing with people. But, you know, I'll give you a metal, metal ruler to measure someone's height, and I can guarantee you that the temperature of the room you're in uh, is going to affect how big that ruler is. Um, and you can get differences in a person's height. Now, it's not as big an error, but it's still the same conceptual issue. We're just dealing with more of it in psychology, but the principle is still the same. Um, and the idea of using uh, cross-sectional studies or experimental studies, those are the exact same kinds of studies that you do in any other sort of field. The only difference is um, the data are coming from different measures. We're using different types of measures. So sort of to circle back and answer your question about self-report measures, can they tell us anything? I would say yes, in part because what we're interested in is it has to come from the person. So if I ask you something simple like, um, how furry do you feel? Scale of 1 to 10, how big of a fan are you? Th explain to me how you measure that aside from asking a person directly. If we tried to find some external way by saying, well, how much money have they spent at a furry convention before? How much uh, furry stuff do they own? How many shows do they watch? There's no, that, those don't work either. You can say, well, you know, I'm a huge furry. I consider myself a furry, but I've never spent a cent buying furry merchandise because I don't care about that stuff. Um, sometimes we rely on self-report just because we have nothing else to go on. But we also try to um, substantiate those or make them uh, conceptually valid measures by using what's called converging evidence. So we'll never just ask, um, how much of a furry are you? But we'll also ask, you know, uh, how many years have you been a furry? How many furry events do you go to? How much money do you spend on being a furry? How much do you identify with the furry group? When people get pissed off at psychologists by saying, why have you asked me the same, essentially the same question 10 different ways? It's because we're trying to validate our measure and make sure that, you know, if you answer the same way 10 times, we may not have a perfect measure, but we're kind of circling around it. Well, yeah. and, and if you ever had a serious job interview, you get asked the same question three three times or more, mm -hmm. different ways, but it's it's the same thing. They're, they're looking for a particular type of answer, <laughs> but in such a way that it doesn't sound like you're answering the same question the same, you know, the, you're not giving the same answer three times. You're, it, it's kind of the same thing. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's to improve your accuracy, really. Well, well hold on. Uh, yeah. There was a, um, there was a company I applied to, and they made you take this online questionnaire basically before they would consider your application. Mm -hmm. And as I was taking the questionnaire, I realized that these are psychological questions. These are questions trying to establish uh, behavioral patterns. <clears throat> And I noticed that certain ones were basically the same thing, but the difference is, is that if you answered yes to one but no to the other, it yeah. indicated that you were more likely to go down this path over here. But if you were to say yes to both, then here, no to both, over here, no, and then the alternate no, yes, over here. Mm -hmm. So even though they seem to both be the same question, depending on how you answered the two of them and then compared them could determined pass. Yeah. And so I started really taking notes. I was like actually writing down the questions going, okay, what could this lead to? What could this lead to? Cause you could go back and change things. So I really started to reexamine myself at that point and went back and changed a whole bunch of my answers going, okay, this is how I rationalize this question. But if I look at these questions over here, if I leave this the way it is, they're not going to want me. And I did get the job. Uh, so it was, it was very interesting. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see more companies doing this either. 
There's that you also sort of tap into. I want to get back to the original question as well. Sort of one more time to circle on it. Um, you asked a very good question about demand characteristics and bias. So how do I trust a person to not just lie or, or give you know the, the positive answer? And that that's that's a bias. That's a, that's a problem built into any question. Now we 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 take courses on how to design questions that avoid that. So if I say, um, for example, how often do you bully others? That's not a terribly good question because bullying is an undesirable behavior. Um, so, you know, right off the bat, a lot of people are going to say no just because they don't want to sound like an asshole. Um, so let's say I ask a bunch of, let's, let's say I say, um, how furry are you scaled to one to 10? You know, if I just just got a, a number, a raw mean, and, and oh, the average furry says six on that question, period, that's a piece of data that's essentially useless. That, that doesn't mean anything in isolation. Right? That, that number is, is, is totally meaningless. But if I start comparing it to other things, then it becomes useful. So if I know, for example, that the furries who answered a nine versus a three on that scale, if I also know that they're more likely to spend more money on furry activities, well now this is a useful variable because it predicts behavior. Or maybe I go out and I give that same question but replace how furry are you with how much of an anime fan are you? And I say, hey look, there's a lot of similarities between the furries who say nine and the anime fans who say nine on this. Now, it's, it's, it's still an, an, imperfect uh, an imperfect measure but let's say I, I go to measure two different people with the same broken ruler. I can still establish which one is taller, even though the ruler is busted or not perfect, I can still tell who's taller with it. It's a relative measure. So the idea is, is I may not be able to, to prove anything with just an absolute value on a scale, but it's when we compare those values to other variables that it becomes useful. So that's sort of my defense for my entire field there. <laughs> no, and, and that makes that makes perfect sense. Uh, and and part of what you were saying earlier also about uh, asking questions in multiple ways, slightly phrased differently depending as to what's going on to try to uh, maybe get a, a slightly different bead on how somebody might conceptualize the question. Uh, yeah. I've seen that. I've I've taken the test several times myself. So uh, I've I've seen this. And uh, we've 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 talked a couple of times how you know yeah a couple of things have been changed around a little bit but we don't want to change a lot of questions because then you kind of run into a small problem of previous research yeah not quite matching up with what you have now because you're comparing a, a perfect example of that actually came up when we asked um, how we ask about sex and gender um, so we've changed how we ask it over different years and so it's really hard to meaningfully compare. Um, the the gender or sex composition of the furry fandom because we ask the question in a different way one year than the next year, and so if we say oh uh, the first year we asked it eighty five percent of furries called themselves male, um, but you know in a more recent year uh, only seventy five percent checked off the box for male, and you might say oh I guess that means there's fewer males in the fandom. I said well no it's it depends on that first survey that that very we very ham handedly asked uh, you know pick one male female or other. Um, on the more recent survey, we said check all that apply, mm. and so when you get and when we have many many more options, so depending on, you know, whether or not you're you're forcing them to pick one or the other, uh, versus giving people a lot of options and they can choose the ones that are most appropriate, you're going to get very different well, yeah. answers. There there are some people who may actually be one gender but play a different gender as well. And so if you weren't clear, you know, if you were asking what's your character's gender or what's your gender or that sort of yeah. thing, that could muddy the waters as well. Well, or even it, these days it goes even deeper with um Oh yeah. The, 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 are, the whole are you are you non binary? Do you prefer are you non binary femme, non binary masculine? Or even to take a simpler okay. example. Let's, let's just say I ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, how furry are you one year? And the next year, instead of a 1 to 10 scale, I use a 1 to 7 scale. Oh. Well, I can't compare those two things anymore because they're apples and oranges. A, a 4 yeah. on one scale means something entirely different than a 4 on the other scale. And so yeah. we, we, we try as best as possible to ask it the same way every year, but you've always got to be mindful. And and it's always kind of the funny thing. Oh, I found a problem with one of your questions. You, you know... And I'm like, well, you know, and I, I, I don't take some times, but a lot of times these questions come down to um, trade-offs. Uh, it's just as much an art as it is a science to design good questions. Say, I don't think people understand just how difficult it is to form a survey like that. And just so you yeah. know, my, my degree is in social development studies, so I have mm. to go through that stuff too. Yep. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah. And, and that's like when, when I argue with people about, uh, I generally argue about religion, but when people like, Oh, here's this study and I'll go look at, at, you know, whatever I can get. Sometimes it's behind a paywall, but I'll go look at, try and find the methodology and I'll come back and I'll be like, okay, this is a piece of shit because a, the sample B the construction C this and that. And people don't realize just how hard it is to construct a, a good solid study that's going to get you usable data well that's what i sort of started off the section mentioning too um it's really easy to make a survey it's really hard to make a useful or a good survey and we run into this when we see other people try to do surveys especially furry surveys or even my undergrads trying to build sort of surveys in their first mm -hmm. years and you see these sorts of like questions for that question is actually asking about three different things or that question is completely biased and is going to pull for one kind of answer over another. Mm -hmm. um, now, so do you, do okay, you often um, sort of double blind it where you'll ask a question that seems like it's looking for an answer, but really you're asking it with an intention for a different type of answer? We try to avoid. Uh, so one of the reasons we try to avoid that sort of thing is because it, that raises questions about the question's validity, right? right. If, if we start lying now, we might lie. Uh, we don't typically lie about what the purpose of our survey is. Sometimes we won't tell the full story because we want to avoid people answering to get a certain type of answer. But yes. if you a start asking really double, uh, double faced questions or questions that are trying to trick people, then very often it comes down to, well, what are you actually measuring then? And so you have to be very right. careful yeah. um, about, we, we call them double barrel questions, uh, questions that actually ask about two or three different things rather than one thing. Yeah, there's another piece about that also, which is uh, the, the trust issue, which in the furry community is yeah. a massive, <laughs> massive issue. I, I know it for well. I've had to deal with it a couple of times myself. But uh, if if you were to start having uh, questions where people start going, okay, well, no, wait a minute. What, 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 are, you, what are you really trying to do here? Because I think you're trying to pull a fast one. With the furry community, I can well imagine that could easily set you guys off. Never mind with whoever's administering the con, but with the mm -hmm. con goers themselves when they catch wind, yeah? It was actually something that came up when we first, when we, Dr. Gravasi first started doing the research. This was shortly after the Vanity Fair article. And here she shows up as a scientist that no one had heard of before at the con. And uh, to his credit, you know, Uncle Kage or Dr. Conway was very... Um, <laughs> open to the idea of allowing her there. But he said, you know, a lot of furries are going to be very leery because they don't know who you are. They, you know, are you just some person who's going to give a really biased survey and then run off and, and try to make furries look bad? And so it's taken us uh, the better part of a decade to establish our credibility. And part of the way we do that is by being very transparent. So we published a, a free book. We run a, maintain a website. We show furries, hey, here's here's what we're doing with the data. And, and very often we're, we're doing it to try to dispel misconceptions and people point the media at us and we say, look, here's what your, mis your misconception is and here's why it's wrong. Um, so it helps build trust, but we still do run into um, issues where we have, we have to always be careful about how we're asking questions. Um, and a perfect example of it actually came up just as we were designing this current survey. Uh, I actually had an argument with my colleague for about a half an hour about this very topic. Um, we've been studying transgender issues and one of the things we wanted to uh, look at was attitudes towards transgender people. We wanted to know, is the furry fandom more accepting of transgender people than uh, other places? So we wanted to, our idea was to give a bunch of questions, go to the general public and get their answers to the same questions and see whether or not furries scored more um, positively towards transgender people. Here's the problem. The scale that existed uh, had a whole bunch of questions that were all about intolerance. So things like, I wouldn't want to work next to a transgender person. I wouldn't uh, trust it if my son or daughter were dating a transgender person. I think transgender people are sinful and immoral, blah, 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 blah. A whole bunch of these questions rapid fire. We actually ended up taking this, those questions out of the survey precisely out of fear of how people would <clears throat> interpret it and say, well, what the hell are you trying to say about transgender people by asking all these questions about why it's immoral? And so even a question that's perfectly innocuous where we have the best of intentions, we have to constantly be aware of what is the person going to mm -hmm. think, you know, uh, or, or a question about zoophilia. If we want to prove that zoophilia isn't really all that prevalent in the furry fandom, we have to ask furries, hey, do you engage in zoophilia? And right off the bat, as soon as a furry hears that, they're going to say, what do you, you know, what are your actual intentions? Are you here to make furries look bad? Are you so, um, 
and that's not unique to furries too. If you were to go out and ask people on the street, hey, you know, are you into zoophilia? Are you into pedophilia? Right off the bat, they're going to get incredibly defensive uh, about whatever you're asking and start questioning, well, what are you, what are you really trying to... You, you might actually end up with a black eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this coming from you of all people right now. I know. <laughs> well, uh, you know, and as soon as you said that, like, unfortunately, my head went right to Roy Moore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Like, like I said at the top. Good of the show, night, I mean, everybody. Well, like I said at the top of the show, I mean that's that's a good portion of the the driving force for having done this one. But um, like I said, the the you know how how you do research is far and away the the much more important piece to this whole thing for our community in total. Not mm -hmm. not because I'm looking to pull in the furs, but because the skeptical guys. Uh, so. There's another uh, there's another piece that I had kind of alluded to, but uh, we also have to address it because when you're dealing, like you said, when you're when you're trying to put together a, a proper survey, you've also got the small bias that's just going to be inherent in it, which is you are you are whether for good or for ill, whether intended or not, you're getting specifically a sample of those who feel comfortable enough and willing enough to go ahead and share their information. And yep. that's a piece that you really, I don't know, can is that something that you can even control for at all? So not statistically, that's a question of, um, we, we, we say that's a question of uh, how representative your sample is. Um, and that's not certainly not unique to doing research with furries. Um, if you wanted to study, for example, um, sexual orientation, or if you wanted to study, uh, they struggle with this, for example, when they're trying to do research on um, fetishes in, in other communities and stuff, or, or very unpopular fetishes or very stigmatized fetishes, how do you get people to, you know, the only people who are going to answer these questions are people who feel comfortable with doing it. Um, so it's certainly not unique to this. And I guess the best way you do it uh, is you the sort of best practices. So things like, uh, if you take our survey, you'll notice we say, you know, several times, this is anonymous. <coughs> um, we don't want your contact information. We don't want your email. We don't want your, we want no way to be able to track this to you. Um, precisely because it allows us to be able to uh, make people feel more comfortable expressing an unpopular yeah. position. Yeah, just, go ahead. yeah, just real quick. Um, so if, to that end, by the way, uh, just to just to give uh, uh, context for this, the surveys that I have taken at Anthrocon have been standard eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper stapled together, mm -hmm. and they give you a good old fashioned. Here, here, here is here is your putt putt golf uh, number two <laughs> pencil, and you mark circles or draw circles around, and very very little that is actual right in and other, so that even for somebody to be looking at it and go, oh, I recognize a handwriting, no. Even even something like that is just not even. One, and even then, even if uh, we do have some written open-ended questions, the first thing that happens is I enter it into a spreadsheet, and then we destroy the original surveys. Um, so the only data we look at is is something that's been typed in and essentially sanitized. We've gone through and made sure that there's no identifying information. There's nothing in there that can track us to you. And the anonymity is important uh, because if we don't make it anonymous, then you write into those kinds of biases where people think, well, I can't be honest on this because what would they think of me? So right off the bat, making it anonymous hugely improves how honest people are willing to be. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a couple of folks that are uh, that are watching at this point, which uh, according to the according to the machine right now, it says it's seven folks. Not that many, but that's okay. Uh, if anybody's got a question uh, over in the live chat, by all means, feel free. Uh, we'll we've got uh, we've still got time enough where we can field. Uh, a couple of questions for you guys to go along with this. Ask your furry uh, researcher anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, also want to make sure, um, Bridget and Joseph, I mean, I know that you guys haven't exactly uh, had much that you've thrown out at this point, but, you know, it, it, you know full well, if there's anything at all, I mean, just feel free. And uh, the rest of you guys, too. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be, I, I'm the moderator more yeah. than anything else, or at least that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't um, want to be covered this too much. There, there was, uh, like we've been talking earlier about, you know, um, uh, mundane or, you know, regular people's reaction to, to things in the fandom. And it just reminded me of something I watched on YouTube uh, last week. Um, 
there is a show I just recently uh, got into the show. It's called the YouTube Saints. Uh, it's two guys. Uh, one is uh, one guy's named Jeff Holiday. The other guy is known as the Wizard of Cause. And they do two shows a week. Uh, they, they they talk about different things. But just recently, they had an encounter with a furry. Quite possibly one of the loudest, most uncensored member of our community uh, to the ranting griffin. And I watched it. Uh, the discussion was was actually pretty lively. Um, you know, they talked a bit about furry. They talked about political. Talked about you know a little bit of everything. But one thing that did come up is uh, during the like they were answering chat questions and stuff. And one guy mentioned the website E six two one. Yep. You, you, the the furries in the group. We all know what this is. And I remember uh, uh, Jeff Holiday. He's oh, I, I got to check this out. And two is like, no, don't, don't do it now. Like, what, what have you? Don't push the button. But of course, uh, Jeff, being you know the caboose that he is, he decides to push the button. And I just want to share this uh, on my screen here. Jeff is the guy on the top. <laughs> that was his reaction. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things you should not Google at work. <laughs> well, thankfully Jeff works out of his house, but honestly, God, like uh, if, if you saw me sort of looking off camera for a while there, I was going back to this video. I was trying as hard as I can uh, to find when he opened the website and his reaction, because I saw that at work and I'm just like, Oh, I, I, I had to bite down on something <laughs> to keep from laughing. I, I his really love these... was priceless. I really That's love those questions. Beautiful. I would love the chance to answer them. Actually, those three oh, questions that yeah, yeah, yeah. By all means. yeah. I'm I'm making sure that uh, the, you guys putting the questions over in the live chat. I'm actually putting them into our text chat over here so that everybody knows what's uh, what's going to be coming up. So that if there's one that's uh, specific, yeah. you know, we can we can specifically target that. Uh, was it, what I want to I want to jump on all three of those. They were great. Okay, go for it. Uh, first and, one was from uh, Captain. Um, yeah, tech. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. All right. Uh, the first one came from uh, Captain Wrongway. Hi, Phyllis. Uh, who's asking, one question, why should it matter what gender you are mentally or physically in this day and age? Uh, I would, as now, um, I want to answer uh, uh, first off because um, I'm taking it from somebody who doesn't know. Mm -hmm. I would assume that it would be, uh, because you're taking a, a survey of the people who are willing to talk with you guys, to kind of get a representative sample of what the furry fandom as a subset uh, culture of... <clears throat> the world really uh to find out where what their percentages tend to be as compared to the rest of the population at large mm -hmm. so uh two two answers to this i love this question i'm so glad someone asked this question so the first one is, is i kind of agree with what you were saying there that just it's comparative purposes so if i ask the same question to anime fans and bronies and furries and sports fans and etc cetera, etc cetera, we can compare the demographic composition of the fan groups and that's interesting in and of itself Beyond that, I'm inclined to absolutely agree with the notion that I don't, in many ways, uh, for, for our own surveys, honest to God, the reason we still ask about it is because people expect us to, and if we don't, they ask us to put it on there. Um, when we publish in scientific journals, they say, what is the sex and gender composition of your, your sample? We, to, to the best of my knowledge, in seven or eight years of studying furries, I don't think we've ever found a significant sex moderation or gender moderation. We've never really had any particularly interesting questions about that. Um, we, we, we only put it there and only ask about it because if we don't and we try to publish a paper, they'll say, well, why didn't you ask about sex and gender? So um, I, I absolutely agree with the idea that I don't think it, we have no strong hypothesis about it. We have no um, particular interest even in the topic. It's just, if we don't ask it, um, other social psychologists and, and places where we publish get suspicious that we didn't ask it. So um, yeah, that's that, that's my honest to God answer. Um, I, 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 I actually really pushed this year to say, well, why are we even bothering to ask it? Um, and I lost out just because of that reason and that reason alone. So oh, it's a terrific question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, considering the option between bo don't even bother to ask it versus you get your, um, you get your, your, your money pulled. Yeah, I, I can, I can easily see that. 
Yeah. So to be fair, in this day and age, it is important to note age matters. Right, so yeah, yeah, yeah age, age, age matters. Yeah, yeah. but but, yeah, but we, we have to that. I, I don't want to sound crass, but uh, really, as far as you know, gender or whatever, there's only really one time, at, at least in my opinion, there's only one time it matters. And that's if you're, you know, go, going for something a little more than uh, a handshake. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, no, honestly, past that, like, yeah. at least for me, I, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care, I don't care what you are. Yeah. As long as you're a good person, you know, you're, you're not being an asshole. We can get along. Uh, so I guess you wouldn't get along with uh, Dennis Leary then, huh? Why would you say that? He did the asshole song. Um, the yeah, only other but, time, I think the only question we've ever asked where we're actually interested in gender was we were approached a few years ago um, by a handful of women at a furry con who asked us specifically if we could do some research looking at um, differences in how men and women feel sort of treated within the fandom. And so we actually looked at uh, some questions about sexism in the fandom. And uh, that again, that wasn't our question. One of the services we do to the fandom is when furries ask us questions, we try to find the answer for them. So that wasn't even one of our questions. We were answering the question that a furry uh, was interested in. And we found a, a few little effects there, but um, they weren't you know, uh, hugely overdramatic. There wasn't evidence of um, super huge systematic sexism in the fandom. Now there were certainly uh, sort of specific instances where women in the fandom had experienced certain types of bullying or harassment in the fandom, um, but there wasn't anything super systematic at least that we could pick up on. But I, I love that question. So thank you very much for asking that question. I'm glad you now, have, Having said that, um, <laughs> have you done any comparisons with other, with other fandoms? Like you, you talk about sports, te- uh, sports fans, yep. anime fans and stuff like that. Um, are is everything kind of normal are there are there any other particular fandoms that do tend to stand out um well the furry fandom is predominantly male um not 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 to go into like a male female dichotomy but we do find yeah. that more people check the mailbox <clears throat> in the furry fandom than what you find in most of the other fan groups that we studied anime tends to be much closer to an even distribution of male and female people in the fandom yeah. um actually this delves really nicely into another question that someone had asked they asked about lgbt people in the furry fandom Yep. So this will dovetail nicely into that. Yeah. So let um, me let me let me sure, preface yeah. that one. So this one was from uh, from Devin Tree Climber who said, "You're doing stuff on furries and sexuality. Do you have any numbers on what percentages of the furries you've surveyed are LGBT? Uh, I am, and I have a theory on that. Uh, and I, I'm assuming uh, that would be hypothesis. And forgive me, it, it's it's just one of those nitpicky things. I'm not trying to start a flame war or anything like that. But uh, so if mean, you had not out. said it, I was going to bring it up. That's I was going to say it's a pedantic treble. Yes. Say, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Devon Tree Climber. The word you're looking for is hypothesis. Thank now, you. No points this round. Oh, you now, group just, of condescending <laughs> buttheads. Okay, just to, just to be just to be fair, just to be fair. This is this is something that comes up every once in a while. We are not at all ragging on you. We enjoy this because we have done it on so many occasions ourselves, and we've corrected yes. each other and and ourselves. It's like, uh, shit, I gotta, I have right. to hit the. So the, the worst part of it is when I have a Facebook thing, and it's just like, oh shit, I've got this policy of not hitting in it. Oh crap, I gotta, I gotta, squirrel. I gotta retract something. Bye. You have right. my. Complete and unchallenged permission to beat the living hell out of tech when you get the chance. So, so and, let's, and Devin, <laughs> Devin says that's why they put theory in quotations. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah exactly. we, we understood that, Devin. Um, unless I'm swearing about something that somebody said, I'm usually just joking, having a good time with it. When I start swearing about it, yeah, I got an issue. So you, you're in the clear and all that. We don't this have is what to have tech a fight. Does. Yes, and if it and if it makes you, this is what we want him to do. If it makes you feel better, uh, Tech misused the word experiment earlier too. <laughs> uh, oh, 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 oh. I, was, I was gonna, I was gonna say it. And I didn't want to be pedantic, but what you described was not an experiment. But no, there, there you go. So, uh, so just, just, just that everybody Burn. understands. This is far, believe it or not, this is far more for the folks that are listening on the podcast than anything else. So. By all means, you know what? I don't be, I don't mind being called out when I make a mistake. So please feel free to to do it more often. That way, how I much can time do you myself. have? <laughs> at, 
at any rate, going back to the question. Please. Oh, I do um, have a son. Yeah. Shut up. I, I, I lost my wonderful dovetail there. But anyway. Um, yeah. so, so to go to uh, LGBTQ questions, um, we do find actually that transgender people, the T there, in the furry fandom uh, are about seven times more prevalent in the furry fandom than what you find in the general population. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Seven? Seven times more prevalent. Oh, wow. Which is one of the reasons why we're we're currently studying them right now, uh, because that's fascinating to us. Uh, we also find that. Oh, sorry. Uh, before I yeah, up, you, you, uh, yeah, just before, just before you move on, then um, with with that being such a, such a huge uh, comparison number, that that qualifies as statistically significant. I would think. Would that not be a a, a worthwhile justification for continuing to ask about the the uh, gender um, self identification then? Um, yeah, we're more interested in transgender self-identification. Do you consider yourself transgender or not? Um, and we do ask about that sort of thing. So we're less interested in whether or not you call yourself a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, binary, non-binary, abinary, whatever whatever label you use. We just want to know, do you self-identify, among other things, as transgender or not? Um, and and so Devin said that that's about what I thought. It was a lot more. Yep, it is much more. And it, it is... if and, uh, there's evidence to suggest it might even be higher than that. One of our more recent surveys suggested that number could be as high as 10 or 11 times higher. Wow. So, yeah, there's um, something to look at there that's um, in-group and out-group behavior because, um, you know, like I call the in-group, the greater society, and um, gender and uh, maybe furries um, tend to be uh, put in the outlier group by the the uh, the status quo. Yep, we're deviants, statistical deviants. Well, yeah, and there is like that I've, may explain the higher numbers. <clears throat> of part of it. Yeah, like I've gone to conventions. I've I've had furry roommates for many years. Um, most of the friends I hang out with these days are all members of the fandom, and there is definitely. A degree of, I'm trying to put this delicately, uh, social awkwardness with a lot of these people. Yes, we actually gave a, a social awkwardness scale. Uh, oh, there's sure. actually a scale for it, and furries <laughs> score higher on social awkwardness than other groups. Yeah, and I mean, the the, the thing is, again, there, there are still a lot of the people in, you know, said fandom even here locally that, you know, are great people. You know, um, actually just, I had a phone conversation with one of them today. Everything was fine, but we go to a we go to a meetup. We go to a, there's a, apparently a Christmas party happening uh, next week or so, and for the most part, a lot of the people there are just really. I, I won't go so far as to say creepy, but you could definitely not see these same kind of people in. Oh, I don't know. Let's say. Um, you know, a, a normal Christmas party, like a company Christmas party. An office party, yeah. Yeah, th these are not the kind of people you would see at an office party. You know, some, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the furs I know, he's uh, he works in finance. Uh, another one, uh, he works, uh, he, well, <laughs> a lot of them work in IT, which I just may have shot myself in the foot because so do I, but... Um, so, so have I. Yeah, but... <laughs> It's one of the more prevalent careers that furries choose. We got well, data on yeah. that too. Yeah, but I, I, <laughs> I seem to be hitting all of your talking points here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You're just a statistic, Dallin. <laughs> if, I, if I could go, I if I go back and blow people, yeah. <laughs> if I go back and blow, blow your mind even more, uh, so in addition do. to being seven times more likely to be uh, transgender, only about 35 to 40% of the furry fandom is uh, straight. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. So furries are, uh, uh, yeah, much more likely than the general population yeah. to be bisexual or gay or pansexual or uh, many other different things. Well, we, we give an, another category, and yeah. With two exceptions. Uh, this is anecdotal, of course, but with, with only two exceptions, um, all people that I know personally who are of LGBTQ status are furries. Two exceptions. Uh, my accounting instructor from college and a transgender person uh, who is a podcaster that we've had on the show before. I speak of Callie Wright. Yeah. But all the other, and I know several trans people, 
and they're all in the fandom connected one way or the other. Isn't that interesting? Because I know lots of trans people too, and I can't think of any that I know are. Now, they may be some that it just hasn't come up, but I don't know of any that I can think of that I know are. Again, this, well, this goes to yeah. like my own personal exposure, you know. No, I know. It's just weird how the, the anecdotal, uh, I don't want to call it evidence, but it, it's vastly different. Our personal experiences. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's something that uh, un unless you just actually outright ask, you're yeah. not going to get an answer on that. And even if you do ask, uh, again, comes up that whole, why are you suddenly asking thing, mm -hmm. trust issue, which is a, is a whole other thing. In all honesty, it's not something that I care about. Like, it, you know, what people's hobbies are, you know, those are people's hobbies. It makes no difference to me. I just like them because of who they are. Yeah. Oh, uh, what else? Yeah. Doc, There's another Doc. question. Yeah. 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 Trippin's question. Yeah, there was one that uh, the trip and put in. Where did I put it over? I see it. It says, "Do furries use actual fur, or is that a no-no?" Yeah. No? We had, that actually came up. Um, we had a, a research assistant. So most of the people on our research team are not furries. I'm I'm one of the only furries on the team, and we had a research assistant who wanted to come with us, and they were asking questions and such. They were an undergrad research assistant, and they asked the question, "Oh, you know, I I my father's a hunter, and he he you know has this like." actual foxtail should i wear that and i was like no for the love of god do not wear that to the con <laughs> right. that is a very yeah, bad idea that's <laughs> social suicide right there yeah i so actually i actually have uh an anecdote on this one because a friend who i'm who i personally know has actually used uh a taxidermed uh implement as part of a first down you also know her Oh, um, we're not getting this one. Who, who, and what? I'm trying to think of a way of identifying her without using names. Use How about uh, side, the side hoof chat? Boots, hoof boots. Hoof boots. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I think I know the one you're talking about. Uh, she actually used a taxidermed head. Oh, wow. oh, okay. Yeah, this is this is one of those things that um, that could very easily get into uh, uh, a, a a massive gray line area. Yeah, and um, she has, she has been asked about it many a times. Um, the animal did die of natural causes. Yeah, but I think in the majority of cases that that's the exception, not the rule. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people in the in I guess my community. I I, I hate to call it that, but. I, I know at least three or four fursuit designers in this town and listening to them talk shop about fabric types, uh, synthetic fur types, <laughs> uh, relative softness, ease to work with. Oh, okay. You, you've heard people get together and talk, you know, IT stuff. And, you know, the, and the majority of the people around just kind of get that uh, glazed air, glazed uh, look in their eyes. Yeah, that, that's me when these people start talking shop about fursuits. Yeah, but, and, and for, for, for context for folks, I mean, if, if you want to try to figure out how outlandish this could possibly be, try to, try to picture this. You're suddenly dropped in the middle of squabbling people who are trying to decide which floss is better to use, DMC or something else for a counted cross-stitch project. You've never dealt with counted cross-stitch before, most likely. You have no idea what the hell floss is, what the differences would be between the colors. Who cares that it's a rose color that's a grad graduated from who only knows which version of red crimson to almost pink and how long it takes oh and who cares what you're going to be using it for oh you're going to use it in a loom project what in the hell are you talking about you don't know any of this stuff that's how <laughs> a lot of us can feel when we're dealing with stuff that we even understand some about it's yeah. the let, same kind of thing let me put it in perspective if you've ever poked into photoshop and tried to count how many hexadecimal combinations there are there you go yeah it's it's not too different yeah yeah when i was asked uh or when i commissioned my partial uh i got a ton of back and forth emails with temperance about uh color type she was sending me pictures of, of just, swatches 
uh, of of different colors and styles that she was willing to use for me. Mm. And just to go back to the the to sort of finish up and wrap up that original question, um, one of the reasons why this is the stigma of using real fur is uh, we've we've shown from our data. Were higher than the average person with regard to uh, support for animal rights and animal rights activism and concern for animals that would, would be even more for the average person. Yeah, oh, you're, you're really breaking up there, buddy. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that, folks. Uh, for for those of you that are listening on the podcast version, please remember, this is what happens occasionally with the networking stuff. Uh, uh, please forgive us. You know, there's only so much that we can work with. But if if you would be so kind to to start that one back on over again, sure. am I am I coming through better now, or am I still chopping? Yes, yes, yes. No, no, you're fine okay. Now. Um, yeah. So when when you study furries, we find that they tend to score higher in concern for animal empathy, care for animals. Uh, opposition to things like using animals for testing, and so it's not surprising, um, given that they anthropomorphize animals, they see animals with these sort of human-like traits, that we also include them in human-like morality. We find uh, inappropriate to use um, these sorts of things, at least more strongly than the average person does. Uh, so it's not surprising to see that the fandom would be a little more opposed to using real fur for a fursuit. Yeah, now leather, on the other hand, um, mostly the furry fetish gear. Um, I have seen, uh, not, not as a suit itself, but definitely as an accent that uh, harnesses, whips, change, uh, stuff, um, uh, you know, armor. <laughs> yeah. Armor. Yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, let's go. Yeah, the no, well, and, correct route. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. I'm saying that because as someone who has worked in leather and wants yeah. to again, I have every intention of making for for a fursuit that I'm still slowly trying to get designed. Uh, I will be using actual leather leather mm -hmm. for for the armor as opposed to trying to get stuff 3D printed or metal working or that kind of thing. Anyway, continuing. Or maybe that was that was. Oh, that's all I had. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, and another thing too. Um, okay, my my character is a tiger. Uh, I don't know if you guys have actually ever felt tiger fur. I would think most of us haven't. Oh, okay, no, I have. I actually have. Um, no, I did not pet a live tiger. I would love to, and maybe someday I will. But no, um, there was something at the zoo where they actually had pelts of, uh, of uh, a tiger and a snow leopard, uh, both of whom had died of natural causes, and... So I got the chance, you know, oh, okay, run your fingers through Snow Leopard's fur. Oh, my God. It, it, it's it's love. Okay, okay. It, it is the softest thing. A tiger, not so much. So, yeah, two things about using real fur. Uh, one, if someone wants to do a, a full tiger fur suit out of natural tiger fur, uh, A, that would be expensive as hell, given that tigers are an endangered species. Two, you wouldn't want to hug them. Because it's a pretty, it, it's a very coarse textured fur, and it would be very uncomfortable. You know, jump at him. Oh, I want to hug you. Oh God, this is painful. <laughs> it's and almost like the ire of a lot of furries. <laughs> yeah, oh. it's a lot like brush bristles. Yeah, the, the I I would not want to be wearing a full natural fur suit of anything. Like like you said before, Duke, about uh, animal rights activists. I mean. It's you want to get crucified. That that's how you do it. Yep. All right. Uh, just just before we go ahead and uh, see about uh, wrapping up here in just a second, uh, heretic woman, if you'd like to go ahead and and uh, and uh, say good night and everything, just to get you out of here, yeah, you know, on I, on I your should. terms. I should. I should. I have a family Christmas thing I'm gonna dig tomorrow. So, yeah. Um, Sorry to hear that. I know. <laughs> 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 um but uh tomorrow monday um on the show we are quite pleased to have dr richard carrier joining us and we're going to talk about why christmas on december 25th is stupid because even if there was jesus he wasn't born then and 
<clears throat> all of that fun stuff. So uh, that'll be tomorrow night, uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern and beyond the trailer park. And we're quite excited about that. So there you go. Very cool. Okay. All right. You have a great time. Uh, safe travels up there. Please be careful. Yes. I know. It's in the snow belt, too. But... Snow! <laughs> Yeah. Well, good luck. Bite me, Tech. Bite me. <laughs> I can't get too far away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the better. Semantics. All right. <laughs> All meantime, right, folks. you take care of yourself, hon. Thank you. I will. Night. Night. Okay. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, uh I want to cover one last question uh, before we get out of here, and uh, it, it's it's not something that uh, I think anybody would have would have thought to ask. Uh, in 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 any particular uh in any particular fashion because i i like to try to kind of work sideways on a lot of these things um now that you've been involved with doing this research which is kind of a confluence between two things that you have you've enjoyed I, I would assume that you've got your doctorate that you enjoy doing research and such, uh, and and having having the numbers to say, yeah, we got we got a thousand response this time, mother, fine. Um, as somebody who's been lucky enough to be able to have that intersection of enjoying what your hobby is, and and it, admittedly, you know, during during the furry conventions and whatnot, that is hobby. Yep. What would you uh, what would you say to folks that might be considering going into research, going into the sciences, to doing research for maybe something that otherwise wouldn't seem to be otherwise worthwhile? I mean, the idea of being a research scientist for the furry fandom of all things <laughs> on its face seems absolutely ludicrous until you realize what you guys are actually doing. Ludicrous yeah. speed. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say that if you're, if you're going to do science, if you're going to do research, you got to be studying something you love. Um, it's because you take a lot of knocks. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times one of our papers has been rejected from publication or the number of, you know, um, I can tell you flat out I've been turned up for jobs because uh, my, my published publication record is great, my teaching evaluations are great, but my research is just a little too weird. They say, eh, we, you know, we, we can't take you on in our position because we just don't know, you don't fit with our department. And so there's definitely a lot of drawbacks to doing research that's a little bit weird, a little bit out of there. But whatever you do research on, you have to love it uh, because yeah, you're gonna uh, encounter your share of drawbacks, your bumps in the road, and if you don't love it, um, it, it certainly pays for for garbage, so uh, you don't do it for the money. You do it because you really do uh, um, have a passion for it. And I, I would also argue that if you are going to go into studying something you love, like like I've done, um, don't be afraid to. But you have to make sure you 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 find a way to make other people interested in it. Uh, and that's been one of the really big tricks I've learned over the years. When I first started out, I, I naively thought I'm just going to study furries because it's an interesting thing to do. Um, that's not how we got grant money. That's not how we, we get published. That's not how, you know, we would never publish our work if we couldn't get others interested. So uh, even though I talk about my research uh, to furries or average people as, you know, furry research, that's not how I talk about it to academics. When I talk to academics, I do fan research. I do media research. I do fan group research. I do fantasy research. I do research on stigmatized minority groups. I do, and, and so you find a way to, the, the onus is upon you to get other people interested in it. You can't expect everyone to to see the value in your work. And until you can do that, um, you're going to constantly be kind of passed over or not taken seriously uh, for it. So that would be my advice is, is figure out how to get other people to, to give a damn about what you're doing because the onus is really upon you to, to do that. You know, normal, <laughs> normally I would... Uh... Yeah, Joe. Well, I was just going to say, it is much easier in some fields to do that. I mean, for example, I'm an amateur uh, tank historian. It's really easy to get people interested in tanks. Anything that goes boom is generally an and easy And weighs, you know, to 30 tons, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to just people research, 
a lot of people are a little too introverted to even give a damn. Yeah. Why would I want to learn more about people? I deal with people every single day. That's a good point. Now, like I was about to say, uh, normally speaking, I'd have something to, to close out the overall with, but truth be told, I don't think that I don't think there's anything that I could add on to what he was just saying to 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 make it worth a damn. If you're gonna do something, <laughs> do something you love. And somehow or other that just that that makes so much sense in so many different ways. Uh, I, I couldn't possibly add anything yeah. better to that. Actually, I do have one question, uh, Nuka. The sure. The statistic you put out about the uh, the seven times more for transgender people mm -hmm. uh, has that been a published uh, is that a published find or is that just something you found uh, in your research? Um, so initially, we just uh, we threw it in there just to kind of because someone had asked, again this is what question that a furry had asked us if we'd never we're not sex researchers ourselves mm -hmm. and so we hadn't uh, sex or gender researchers so we thought well we'll ask it just to kind of see and it was one of those things that was like oh. Maybe we should. So we only asked about it once in kind of a very passing manner, got this very surprising results. And so the first thing we did was we've now brought on a researcher who specializes in transgender uh, issues. And now we're currently reinvestigating it and sort of doing it properly okay. now. Um, okay. Once we do, then we'll go get it, hopefully get it published. Um, yeah, I'm... Yeah, I, I, just because, uh, again, some of the circles that, uh, that this group runs in and uh, some of the circles I run in, that would be one hell of a tidbit to um, to let people know about. However, uh, skeptics that again, a lot of us, um, a lot of the circles we run in are very skeptical about it. Were we to say that, uh, they'd be like, "Well, can you back it up?" And that's yeah. why I was asking um, if there was if there was already something cited for it. Um, but if not yet, I would be very interested uh, when that uh, paper is finally published. I'd love to read that. Sure. I mean, at the moment, the data is collected, so we, we, we can say that it's a, it's a finding. There's no published journal article you can point to yet, but the data are there. Okay. Um, that we can say you know that we're reasonably confident that the number is, is fairly consistently there. Um, and I want to sort of mention as well, it's part of a larger project. I mentioned that we got this huge grant from the Canadian government, and we're, we're doing more than just sort of counting, well, okay, what proportion of the furry fandom is transgender? One of the things we're, we're, we're looking at as part of this grant is um, do transgender people in the furry fandom tends to be doing better and adjusting better than transgender people who don't have a fandom like the furry fandom. And we are hoping to show that the, the acceptance that the community provides and the sense of belongingness, a lot of transgender people better off in the long run uh, when they have the furry fandom, despite it being a little bit weird and a little bit stigmatized, oh, than oh people boy. who are transgender and trying to suffer, for, you know, who, who are suffering through it without support, without a group of people who are there, sort of who have their back and accept them for who they are. You want to talk one degree of separation. Yeah. Um, a friend that I actually roomed with for a number of years, he has, he is currently undergoing transition. Mm -hmm. So I could actually sit them down and, and probably ask those very questions. Uh, again, it would, it would be strictly anecdotal, but you know, I'm suddenly very interested now. Mm -hmm. You know, again, a lot of us here, we are acquainted with people who are transgender, some in the fandom, some not in the fandom. Um, yeah, this is, uh, sorry for rambling, just this is really interesting. But those numbers, don't, don't they, at least for me, intuit, intuitively, they, they make sense. Yeah. I, I think when you look at the fact that the fandom is a, it's not the, um, this is one of those correlation causation questions. It's not the case that uh, furry is causing people to become transgender, but rather if you are transgender, you're a person who will find the furry fandom to be an accepting place because this is a sort of be who you want. Um, we, we love you for who you are kind of place. And that's kind of a nice place to, to be if you're a person who's really struggling to find acceptance um, from the community around you. It, for, for me, it's like um, what I was trying to... Um, um, was quite a bit to unpackage, but um, I tend to look at uh, reward a lot. And what I was trying to say earlier is that um, people who are put in a kind of, or feel in an out group um, position, they tend to seek reward in different ways than people in the in group. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think uh, the way we might put it, um, in, 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 if you want to put it in sort of psychological jargon, 
we say that members, uh, people who are in sort of a stigmatized or deviant group uh, tend to have sort of a higher need to, to find belongingness in some, in some place, find a place to be, to feel a sense of inclusion. And in fact, when you talk to furries, uh, I think it's 50% uh, more likely to have a history of being bullied, of feeling ostracized, of feeling stigmatized. And so for many of them, this is the first place they've ever known where they can belong and say, oh, this is a group of my people. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going back to what I had said earlier about myself. Look, I'm brash, I'm foul-mouthed, I'm an asshole, I smoke, I drink. And, you know, one of the big issues that I've had, especially in trying to find a job, is that, yes, I am currently diagnosed with PTSD, and it's an ongoing thing. <clears throat> now, one might not easily see the connection between you know, military experience like that and uh, big fluffy animals. But it's it's just a place where, you know, people don't judge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got to see about wrapping this up here in just a second. But uh, Tech was just letting me know that uh, he's, he's going to bounce out. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that you got your opportunity. So... Thanks for the time that you were able to give us, man. You have yourself a, a good restful night or morning at this point. Yeah, it's definitely going to be restful. Whether I make it to the bed or not is, is debatable at this point. Um, thanks for coming on the show. Glad to have you. Hope you come back again. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I received, despite my drowsiness, uh, I, dis I received one heck of an education today. So thank you very much for teaching me things I did not know. Very happy to, to chat. <laughs> okay, Tech, you take care of yourself. Man. All right, good night. And um, this, like I said earlier, I, I didn't know what I could add uh, before we uh, before we close it out. I'll, I'll drop you with two, as a matter of fact, because uh, Trippin had also said, what a great show tonight. Add tonight to thought. Uh, not quite sure how, how you're wording it, but I again, I read directly off of the screen uh, so that there's no you know ambiguity about how I'm doing it over here. Um, add tight, add tonight to thought. I'd never learn what I learned tonight. I know what it is that you're what you're trying to get across, even even if the wording isn't isn't quite going this way. And uh, Stephanie has just also added to this. I second that. Fascinating. Uh, and tripping again. Yes, very educational. Um, this is this this is why I love doing the show sometimes because every once in a while we will go down somewhere where we were not expecting to learn as much as we did and we really 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 do um so I'm I'm very I'm very gratified for that but I I want to go ahead and leave this off of uh, a piece that I'm sure that uh uh, Nuka, I'm pretty sure that you've heard this one before and uh Joe and Dell and I'm I'm sure that you have and it was something that uh, Uncle Kage was videoed having said, and it was part of a it was part of another video. And I I, I really don't know. Uh, I'm pretty sure I can find it. Just somebody drop it into the into the into our chat so I don't forget about it. And somebody had asked him at a panel, "Who are furries?" And he he went on this long this long piece. But uh, I will I will I will summarize. Uh, so I will summarize we we furries have been the outcasts the ones that were picked on the last ones picked in gym we were the we were the ones who were frowned upon but we gravitated to those that gave us comfort in our youth and for a lot of us it was tv and cartoons and the vast majority of those cartoon characters were what we would typically call furries now anthropomorphized animals Fast forward to today. Who are we furries today? We are the furries who grew up and never got rid of our childhood friends. And I think in a lot of ways that really sums up who we are. We're not weirdos. We're just good friends for a long, long, long time. As always, everyone, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us tonight. We hope that you found something worthwhile in all of our perspectives and learned a little something along the way tonight. And uh, I, I know I speak on behalf of, you know, Dallin, Joe, and myself on this one in particular. If there's something that you would like to ask of us anytime, 
on the on the furry front by all means you can always get in contact with us and of course i'm sure the good doctor will have uh, lots of opportunities but let me go ahead and say good night for everybody in this particular case very especially dr nuka dr courtney dr dr plant Dr. I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> it's it's strange. <laughs> it's strange. Uh, who am I to judge? I'm I'm sorry. Some people get that reference. Some of you have not really wanted to be on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm sorry. But in any case, um, uh, I, I'm going to say it this way simply because, Courtney, it has truly been an honor and a pleasure to have you on tonight. Thank you so very much, especially on kind of relatively short notice to join us and staying a little a little overtime on this one. Um, when we get done over here, of course, uh, we'll have a, a couple of minutes to chat with you. If you've got it. So don't just disconnect, sure. but thank you for very much for being with us on the show tonight. It's been a pleasure. I, I would love to come back sometime. All right. Uh, I've got, uh, I've got listings for you right now for, uh, in the show notes for, uh, firstscience.com and your, uh, your link over for that, for your information in particular. Uh, is there anything that you would like uh, uh, you'd like folks to know for you or contact information uh, above and beyond that at this point? Um, that's probably the best place to get a hold of me. If you go through First Science, that's where all our data. If you want to nerd out, and you can download our book for free. First, it's called First Science, conveniently enough. And uh, if you want to, you know, win internet arguments, it's like two hundred pages of every furry statistic you could ever want to know. <laughs> Eat that the truth. Thank you so That'd very much, man. That that sound you heard was the lock and load of every fur listening to this. <laughs> <That's true>. oh. <laughs> Joseph, thank you very much for your time, man. And uh, I hope that you have a, a restful rest of your day tomorrow or today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm actually quite busy because my days off are spent, as you know, renovating. Uh, I just wanted to to say you know i didn't participate much today um it's but uh yeah i've learned a lot so thanks a lot for uh for um educating me <laughs> um it's uh, you know the furries is something honestly it's something that i don't really understand um all i know is that the people doing it are getting something out of it um and that in itself is something so um yeah i would like to understand more about it yeah no worries that's i mean that's that's kind of the reason why i wanted to do it like this because it's a little i mean we've talked about the furry side of it all for for a couple of us for several times over but i really wanted to get into the science piece uh, especially and i i kind of thought that that was something that you would definitely want to have the opportunity to glom onto. Well, yeah, and I mean, um, this is something like, like Huey, as you know, human behavior is something that I'm, I'm, I'm totally fascinated with, but I, I tend to have developed my own terminology when, um, you know, treating subjects like this. <laughs> I kind of hesitate to get involved, but uh, yeah, but I, but I learned a lot today. Excellent, Joey. Thank you very much for uh, being able to make it. I'm, I'm very glad that. Uh, it, the techie dis, dis, uh, for those of you that don't know last night was uh, a travesty of technical support prowess oh we'll just put it at that but joe i'm glad that we were able to get you on for tonight well i almost didn't make it but that it's it's just the weather here lately um it has very much affected my sleep schedule um it's i can't think of a better word for it i hibernate yeah, that's pretty much what we said. So, all the more reason. Thanks for making it, man. Yes. I try. Bridget, of course, thank you very much for your time. I, again, I'm kind of guessing that it kind of ended up being the same way for you as with Joseph, that, you know, not exactly totally in your wheelhouse, so not really totally sure where to go. Yeah, I mean, not really any way that I could contribute, but it was still interesting to listen to, and I learned a lot. And you didn't run away screaming, so that's going to count for something. I didn't run away screaming. It's going to count for something. Yeah, uh, I, I have, I have to imagine though that um, uh, the the piece about the um, uh, the seven times more prevalent uh, for the LGBT uh, rep representation in yeah, our fandom. Kind of, that was kind of stunning, but after hearing him 
you know, uh, speak on that, it, it makes sense that uh, that there would be some overlap between you know a, a part of a community that's ostracized you know by society at large finding community somewhere yeah. else with the with you know uh, other people that would consider themselves outsiders true enough all right and Dallin, of course thank you for your time twice over at this point yeah pleasure to be here as always and you do your thing yes of course um Shujin has referred to the podcast version of the show. Of course, I'm the curator of the audio uh, version of this, which you can find up at holycraftoflogcast.com. And if I ever do get off my ass and start, uh, you know, pouring my inner soul into the internet once again, uh, you can find that at uh, inthewind.yo5.ca. Oh, which is, uh, of course, linked off. Uh, as you said, if you want to podcast, swing on over to the website, but all of our contact information is available over there again for you. So uh, feel free to, to take advantage of that. All the social links and everything is right there. Uh, if you'd like to leave a voicemail message, of course, the phone number is still 859-HCTV-554, 859-4288-554. Um, I know full well that there is some, um, some bullshit that's happening over at... Uh, the nice folks over there at Patreon. I know I've kind of mentioned about Patreon before a couple of times, and yes, we did get we did get somebody who uh, who donated some money previously, and still thank you for that. Um, for the time being, I do still have Patreon listed, and I do still have the account over there, but I don't know that I can, in good conscience, suggest it for the time being. If anybody wants to support us. I'm not entirely versed in what's going on. All I know is that there's a payment structure that they're screwed around with that is making it harder on the people who are donating versus the people that had been donating previously. So, you know, if if you're looking to donate for right now, just hold off. Don't even worry about it. I, we don't normally ask. And I, I usually are, am really bad about that, so don't, don't sweat it too much. If you're thinking about doing, you know what, just hold on. If, if nothing else, maybe send it to a, to a cancer research hospital in our name or something. I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But, uh, of course, we'd love to hear from you. So you can just drop a drop an email anytime, and we'll see what happens from there. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, I've got a lot of show notes that are going to be uh, dropped into for us all so uh forgive me if you got a, a whole bunch of them to deal with I'm, I'm sorry about that but we'll see what happens but in the meantime all of you that were uh on the live chat with us of course uh trippin stephanie uh got wrong way i know it's fearless and uh dev uh vex uh, thank you uh i know devin was over in there earlier so um uh, i'm pretty sure i got everybody and oh i'm sorry uh test what was it uh, test one, two, three, the Roblox player. I, I do not know if you are still there and listening. If not, uh, I'm sorry, but still, thank you for being part of it. And we will look forward to talking with you guys again sometime soon. Uh, I may have to impose on Callie Wright because there's, there's other sex aspects that maybe we should end up talking about because, um, because Bridget threw something my way. Uh, and yeah, Something tells me that we've got to we've got to have a very long discussion about something. But in, in any case, you all take very good care of yourselves. Stay safe. We'll be looking forward to talking with you sometime soon. As always, I wish you all the peace I no longer have. I wish you the strength that I've learned. I wish you well, safe travels wherever it takes you with all of this cold weather that's happening. And of course, as always, for my lady, twelve and a half years on, I am still in love. Not today, Fujin. I love you and I miss you. Dream of me. Till the next time we get together, everyone, as always, good night. <laughs>